around the globe to our second virtual mini summit on green economy and climate change cooperation between India and the European Union and the UK. This is part of a Europe India 4040 news campaign. And this is to engage a EU40 cohort of 2021 across Europe, India, and the UK to promote relations between European Union, the UK, and the India. So now I, I now request our chairman, Sujit Naya, to start the proceedings of this summit and move on from there. Over to you, Sujit. Yeah. You're on mute. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Councillor Aryan. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, distinguished guests, members of parliament, panel speakers, and delegates. Uh, as Councillor Aryan mentioned, my name is Sujit Nair, and I'm the chairman of Europe India Center for Business and Industry. Uh, we are a multilateral trade body and in association with our various partner organizations, we have been playing a role in promoting closer trade and relations between India, UK, and EU over the past 10 years. As part of our initiatives, we have organized 24 major business summits in the Europe, with 20 summits at the British Parliament in London, two at the European Parliament in Brussels, whereby EICBI and its delivery partners have engaged more than 3,240 delegates from 2,190 companies. These summits have provided an opportunity for British MPs, European MEPs, and Indian lawmakers to not only get to know each other, but also engage in discussions with companies which are planning to expand into these regions. We have also organized numerous delegation visits to India, which have provided opportunities for MPs and companies to get a first-hand experience of Indian markets. Annually, uh, we release a listing of top 40 under 40 leaders called Europe India 40. And this listing includes leaders below the age of 40 from UK India corridor and EU India corridor and, and are doing great work in promoting EU India relationship and UK India relationship. As part of our initiative to promote the works of the Europe India 40 leaders, we are currently carrying out a campaign called Europe India 40 Views, hear from the leaders who will shape the future of UK, India, EU, India relations. As part of this campaign, we are organizing a series of mini summits, which focus on various topics which Europe India 40 leaders are passionate about, so as to share their message and work to a wider audience. Uh, we had the first mini summit, which focused on the impact of Brexit on UK, India, and EU, India relations on 22nd January. Uh, for the second mini summit that is on today, we are focusing on green economy and climate change cooperation between India and the European Union and India and the UK. I'm looking forward to hearing the views and opinions of four members of parliament, uh, two from India, one from UK, one from the European Union, uh, followed by a panel discussion by eight of our Europe India 40 leaders. Uh, in the case of India, uh, India's Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi has envisioned making India a $5 trillion economy by 2024. For India to achieve development objectives, its economy should grow, should continue to grow. But for a country like India, where development is imperative, environmental consequence can be substantial as will face serious constraints on natural resources such as land, water, minerals, and fossil fuels, driving up energy and commodity prices. The extent to which India's economy will grow green will depend on its ability to reduce the quantity of resources required over time to support economic development that leads to enhancement of social equity and job creation. Green growth, growth could play an important role in balancing these priorities. In the case of the European Union, the EU biodiversity strategy for 2020 aims to restore forests, west, wetlands, create green spaces in urban cities, establish protected areas of 30% of the land in Europe and 30% sea of Europe. In the case of UK, in July 2022, the UK pledged 3 billion pounds towards a green investment package uh, in the mini budget, uh, Mr. Rishi Sunak, Chancellor of Executor, promised to establish a green home grant, decarbonize public buildings, and create green jobs. I now look forward to hearing from experts about their views on green economy and climate change cooperation between India and UK and India and EU. I would now request Councillor Aryan to take forward the discussion. Thank you very much, Sujit, for giving your insights and introduction about our summit. Um, is, is Svenja there now? She... 
you're on mute sujit uh cause sorry i think when ask the honorable mp uh get it a doctor get it solan kg to start yeah. the two okay. yeah thank you so so now we're going ahead with the member of parliament introductions and they'll give their own insights about the summit and and on the topic of green economy <clears throat> and climate change so may i invite shri dr kirit prembai solanki ji uh, from ahmedabad he is a member of parliament uh, representing ahmedabad gujarat a very close friend of prime minister narendra modi who is from the same state and just 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 to give a, a a a small introduction about dr solanki that he's one of the most impressive mps based on the survey done by asia post it's one of the magazines that tells uh, that rates the mps and so we're very proud of you for the title that you won in 2018 and 2019 sir and and also he's not he's got some designations within the portfolio and one of them is is a, a penal speaker of the 17th lok sabha chairman of the parliamentary committee on the welfare of um scheduled caste and scheduled tribes is is a social medical relief um, awardee for the year 2017 and also bharat gaurav pushkar award in 2020 professionally he is a renowned medical doctor a surgeon and specialized in laparoscopic surgery um he's is one of the long standing mps from the state of gujarat and we're very honored and privileged to invite you sir uh, we also thank his close friend mahendra jadeja ji known as dada from the uk who is <coughs> who is currently uh, one of the uh, one of the members who would uh, would promote india uk relations within the uk currently is a member of uh, conservative friends of india as well one of the executive members so thank you for inviting dr kiriji and uh, dr kiriji it's all yours thank you for joining us and we look forward to hearing you now you, you're on mute sir you're on mute sorry uh thank you very much for uh, using the wonderful words for introduction of mine i am really very much thankful to you and i feel it's a matter of great privilege for me to join the europe india to business uh, and industry center indeed it's a matter of great privilege and pride for me to join as a speaker thanks europe india center for business and industry and its entire team of for inviting me and also to say that it's pleasure to share the stage with other mps across the world miss swanja hand mr robin boor and shri mr rami reddy and the panelists chairman and vice chair sujit and aryan of ei cbi and mr mahendra jadeja my close friends from london for inviting me really i am very much thankful to all of you uh, the topic is the green economy and climate change i personally i think that climate climate change is a one of the most hazardous thing for the world see the terrorism is also the hazardous for world but i will put climate change ahead of the terrorism because because of climate change the entire earth is facing the problem and so many the ill effects we are facing just now that is because of because of a climate change yes i believe that there has to be a development also the industry should grow also but at the same time we have to make a balance between industrial growth and the pollution at a large and because of this 
this balance is being reverted this balance is not observed in a proper way now the entire world is facing the climate change and it is a one of the most uh, most uh, uh, difficult things in coming future years also our honorable prime minister sri narendra bhai modi ji has addressed the climate change since long when he was chief minister of gujarat state before he became prime minister of india he recognized the climate change and he cautioned the world and india as a whole that we have to be very careful to addressing the issues of the climate change so climate change is a very much a horrible things and we have to be very much uh, sensitive to prevent the changes of climate the pollution and all these things uh, if i make a remark that for the climate change the responsible countries in the world are mainly the developed country the developed countries are the responsible for making the climate change the developing country and under developed countries their contribution for climate change is very negligible or very less and i personally believe that the for climate change the developed countries should should accept their responsibility and they should share more for the countering the climate change that is a one thing and the green economy uh, i think the green economy the india is having you know the india is the fastest growing economy and at present we are number 6 country in the fastest growing economy in the world and our honorable prime minister narendra modi ji has always focus on the green energy also narendra modi ji since has since he has become the prime minister of the india he has focus on a renewable energy and as you know the india has tremendous scope of a renewable energy whether it is a solar energy whether it is a wind energy whether it is a so many other sorts of a green energy india is a main country who can contribute for the things and i am really proud to share with you that as a prime minister of india sri narendra modi ji has contributed for a renewable energy the india is a leading country for production of a renewable energy india is having so many solar plants so many wind energies and at present our government is encouraging rooftop energy energy so the all the households they can install a rooftop solar plant and they can develop the renewable energy for their requirement also and this is because of this thing is because of our honorable prime minister narendra modi ji's uh, efforts he has always focus on a renewable energy and we have a tremendous solar uh, sunlight here throughout the india so the india is having it's a, it's a, it's a strategic things that we can produce green energy to the maximum things and the green economy which you have mentioned i think the we have to make a balance between development between a industrialization and and the climate change that balance we have to keep we have to uh the emission carbon monoxide and emission we have to reduce and control the emission for our industrial things also and india is committed to paris agreement which was conducted a uh, few years back india has signed the paris agreement and our honorable prime minister sri narendra modi ji always stress that we have to be abide and we have to jo religiously observe the climate change and the paris agreements also so the economy uh, the, the 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 green economy that is a economy through the uh, 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 um, renewable and green energy source india is a robust economy at present and the india the way in spite of the covid 19 pandemic india this the recent budget 
was presented in the Lok Sabha was a very much a robust project. It has aim for infrastructure. It has it has a aim for uh, 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 healthcare. Uh, it is for development. It is for renewable energy. That is the main motives of our budget, and and we need to have a renewable energy. Otherwise, our globe cannot survive in future. That's why I congratulate you and your entire team for selecting a wonderful subject that is a climate change and the green energy. I really congratulate you and your entire team for selecting a befitting subject, which is a threat for the world nowadays. I, 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 I again congratulate and I'm thankful that you have invited me to be a speaker in this August gathering. I'm really thankful to you and my fellow colleagues that because of such webinar, I think we can contribute more and more for checking the climate change and for creating the green energy as well as the green economy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Solankiji. Thank you for your great insights and all the inputs that you've given. And I'm sure you would submit this report to Prime Minister Narendra Modi, your friend, and would ask him to engage with organizations like us, uh, all the panel speakers, the MPs that are contributing uh, within this summit. Thank you very much. I think we have one question. One question from Mahindra Jadeja from London. So. Yeah, uh, he's welcome, Mahindra Jadeja ji. Yeah, so j just just to give an uh, introduction about Mahindra Jadej, he's, um, he's an India-UK business consultant. He's, he's engaged in a lot of India-UK relations. So Mahindra Jadej, one question very quickly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Arya, and thank you, Sujit. Uh, I wanted to say thank you for, uh, you know, the Dr. Solanki to join. And uh, you know, although in, in spite of... Uh, He's a, such a busy man traveling there, but, but he's uh, happy to join. So yeah. in your, you know, the first, uh, you know, the moving, but you are, you know, moving in the right direction. So first, uh, um, Aryan, if I can, uh, you know, the, just the, take the opportunity going back when the first time Prime Minister arrived to this country and, you know, announced, you know, the direct flight from the Ahmedabad to, you know, the, to, to London. London. Uh, this is all thanks goes to the you know the Dr. Solanki himself and CR Party, who is uh, you know the chairman of the you know the now the Gujarat State. They came uh, came to Delhi and and uh, recommended to the you know the previous government that look the Gujarati community needed. So officially, I haven't had a chance face to face to thank him. In although we, we verbally said so thank you, but my just quick quench, uh, question to you, Dr. Solanki, there there are. Lots of people wanted to deal with the, you know, India. India is a big in the continental life. It's, I believe it's a 29 state. I wonder whether you have a, any kind of, a, you know, the central portal whereby all the, you know, the boxes are there for the which state is what offering for the, uh, you know, the, you know, if anybody would like to come to FDI. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, I just got the, you know, the call. If, if it's a many, many, uh, you know, foreign direct investment wanted to, go, you know, the join and do the business. So what are your plans for the, you know, the creating and giving the opportunity to the SME? And what are your plan to, uh, you know, the, do the central portal whereby any you know, foreign direct investment can, uh, you know, the check the state, you know, how easy is, uh, you know, the labor law, how easy is the business to do? in that particular state. Uh, can you elaborate? Uh, really, your question is a very interesting question. And I, I really am very thankful for asking such a wonderful question to me. Regarding the foreign direct investment, our country is always eager to have a more and more FDI from different parts of the country also. And I would like to mention here that when our Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji was Chief Minister of Gujarat. He started a vibrant summit for Gujarat. And the motive of the vibrant summit was that to invite the FDI from different part of the country to Gujarat. Now Narendra Modi's horizon is entire India. And he is very keen to have a more and more FDI in India so that we can use the 
green economy also and we can we can develop the country also and the even the and, and the benefit of development for india will be there it will be shared to entire world so we always respect the fdi also and we are we are very much interested and eager to have a more and more foreign direct investment in india and india has a tremendous opportunity in different field to have the fdi whether it is a field of infrastructure whether it is a field field of mines whether it is a field of uh, uh, energy production the india is having a variety of uh, sources on which we can invite the fdi thank you very much thank you thank you kiriji and doctor uh, sorry mahendra ji for such a great question that's very helpful for everyone uh, every one of our delegates all right thank you sir i hope you can wait couple couple more minutes to hear from our other mps who is going to speak and then it's probably you can choose it's my pleasure to listen to them it's my pleasure yeah. to listen to them thank you very much and uh, we've got two other mps uh, about to speak and um, may i invite <coughs> miss fenya han uh, from <laughs> germany so kiriji could you go on mute please Yeah so all right so Svenja I'm going to invite you now but before I do that um uh, may I just give you an introduction about yourself uh Miss Svenja Han at the age of 31 is one of the youngest member of European Parliament in Europe she represents the Free Democratic Party in Germany but alliance of liberals in the European Union and she is from Hamburg Germany Svenja was also the president of European Liberal Youth from 2018 to 2020. Professionally, she is a she has a master's in uh, in media studies and briefly worked for public relations uh, as a public relations manager for corporate companies. She is a member of the following select committees: the Internal Market and Consumer Protections, Digital Age and Artificial Intelligence, and also a delegate. for delegation for relations with the countries of southeast asia and the association of south asian nations thank you swenya for joining and we look forward to your speech and future cooperation with the organization e e which is the europe india center for business and industry thank you very much uh, swenya it, it's it's down to you now Thank you so much for the nice introduction and thank you so much uh for having me with you today uh because it's it's a great opportunity to address this event I'm as well working in the trade committee and I'm uh, specialized on on uh, the Asian region and especially India so it's great to see that there is uh, picking up more cooperation again between India and the EU thank you for having me on this important topic and it's a really important time to discuss this also so bilaterally because climate change and sustainable growth um are important questions and i really hope that they are going to be high on the agenda for the eu india leaders meeting which is planned to be in uh, in portugal in may this year hopefully in person and not only online um because we're very eager to see concrete actions and proposals from that meeting uh eu and india have such a long standing partnership and experience of cooperation uh in in the area of of economy and combating climate change and i believe there is much we can contribute together and there are three areas i would like to address with you today on eu india relations in that area because first and foremost i believe global issues require global solutions eu and india need to continue to step up our cooperation on climate change and greening the economy especially in an international fora um we are partners working for reform in in the un and and most recently in the world trade organization and uh, we need to coordinate as well in a g20 setting and if we're taking a hard look at the eu india strategic partnership road map to 2025 uh, that was agreed upon the eu india summit last summer 
uh, it clearly states that the goal to cooperate for the full implementation of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, including the Paris Agreement. And together we have worked for it already and will continue to support global efforts to tackle climate change and um, for, for example, by constructively engaging in global stock check in uh, 2023, um, which will inform updating and enhancing the actions and support in accordance with Paris Agreement. I believe we can only do this together and it's good if everyone else uh, does something, but only together we're good. And that is why I believe we need to lead by example. We know that solutions to global issues need to be sustainable and reached on a global level. And I mean, yes, uh, as, a, as a politician and as businesses, we often know that the wheels of multilateral organization and institution sometimes move painstakingly slowly. And um, therefore we also need to, to lead by example on our own, but also together. And that's why we also need bilateral uh, cooperation to reach our goals on a multinational international level. And uh, the EU and India have several partnerships, dialogues, ongoing projects when it comes to different aspects of combating climate change. And uh, the roadmap to 2025 highlights uh, the need to continue the good bilateral work. So I believe we, we must work to further strengthen the EU-India Clean Energy and Climate Partnership um, that was agreed in the 2016 summit. And uh, we need to jointly prepare and implement a new work program. Um, and additionally, I believe it's also important to hold regular meetings on, on the EU-India climate change dialogue to strengthen our cooperation on all aspects of climate change policies uh, to then be a good example to the international uh, fora. Because this roadmap is meaning to strengthen our dialogue on environment, establishing a stronger partnership for example, on resource efficiency, on circular economy. And this is a topic that is especially very dear to my heart. I've been working on, on the a new circular economy action plan in, in the European Parliament. And I, I can only stress how important it is that we more and more shift from a linear uh, to a more circular economy if we are serious about uh, combating climate change. And uh, that is like the, the third remark I would like to make. I believe that trade cooperation has a large potential for climate action and sustainable growth. And uh, with, the, with the Circular Economy Action Plan uh, in the EU, um, we not only need to work that uh, on ourselves. So we're not an island being isolated. No, we're, we're a trade organization. We have many partners. And that is why we, we need to implement circular economy as well in trade perspective. Uh, because it can have a better impact to make our economies more sustainable, more resilient, uh, to allow for more sustainable growth if we uh, decouple it more and more uh, by primary uh, resource use and yeah, bring uh, climate action and trade dialogue into real life action. So I think we need to lead by example and it's also important to convince others to follow in our footsteps and um, if we're taking a look at what the EU is doing, we look at the um, trade and sustainable development chapters of trade agreements, which are aiming at doing that. And by including climate provisions, such as reference to the, to the Paris Agreement um, in our trade deals, we show that we believe climate action is a cross-cutting issue that needs to be tackled on all possible levels, on all possible ways, together with our trade partners. It is yeah, at the end of the day, um, it's uh, nice and good and important if every one of us unilateral does their best. Um, but the best possible way will only reach by cooperation, bilaterally and multilaterally. And I do believe that EU and India together can achieve a lot of this area. So thank you very much for listening um, for, for my ideas uh, on, on what we can do together there. And I'm happy if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Svenja. Um, we'll be taking questions once we finish uh, the other MP speech. Um, so, did, did you want to? Uh, Uday, I think you can take the questions. Let me just check with the other MP. He was online till now, I'm not able to see it. Can you just check whether he's online?
Arun, can you check if uh, Mr. Ramirad is online? Sujit, I can't see Mr. Ramirad Garu online at the moment. Okay, fine. So, uh, does anyone have questions, please? For Svenja, um, firstly, Svenja, thank you for a great speech. I mean, you, you touched upon the circular economy. You, you touched upon why we need to act. I mean, such quite a very interesting points about how we can move forward with this climate change and the whole uh, idea about cooperation around the world. Um, so thank you for that. And um, I hope, does anyone have any questions, please? Come on, guys, we've got the member of European, youngest member of European Parliament, I would say. I have a question, if you don't mind, Councillor. Yeah, yes, please, Manu. Um, thank you, Svenja. Thank you very much for that uh, interesting speech. I was uh, quite um, interesting to see the intent that from the youngest parliament to member to bring forward a circular economy as well as climate change impacts. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Manu Shashizan. I'm one of the um, EU 40 under 40 members who work for the University of Cambridge. My question was that to do with, there is a lot of talk about, and, and clearly so, that we need to achieve the SDG 2030 targets and, and everyone is on that common ground for that. Um, but from a climate change or a climate resilience perspective, um, it, there are often voices that's heard that it's not captured quite well within the so-called SDG targets. So what would you think is the role that um, European Union as well as generally in the countries around the world um, need to do that to make sure that climate action targets are met while meeting the SDG targets as well. Absolutely important topic. Thank you very much. In fact, I'm not the youngest member. I'm one of the younger ones, but we have the youngest one. She's actually only 22 years old from Denmark, which well, is very well, impressive. But I'm, I'm among the youngest, but I don't want to claim a wrong title. For yeah, me. well, I made it clear one of the youngest. I didn't, I didn't specifically say that. Exactly. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think we, we need to tackle it on, on different levels, and it's important that we tackle it on all the policy we're doing. And um, on, on the EU level, for example, it's important that we focus it with, with the money we're spending. We have the, the recovery fund, the Corona recovery fund, 30% um, of it's, uh, it's uh, going to digitalize, digitalization and part of 30% is going to um, the Green New Deal. It's important that we trickle this down to all the policy and all the policy areas we're doing. Um, we need to bring it into a foreign and security policy because it will be an issue for security in many aspects. Um, we need to bring it on, on um, cooperation, on research and innovation as well. Um, we need to bring it in our, on our development policy and our human rights policy. Uh, we need to implement it on, a, on our um, trade policy. So um, you can only bring it into action if you do not have a silo thinking about, um, about uh, fighting and combating climate change. But if you really start implementing in all areas of, of your policy and all area of um, your economy and make it essential part of any international cooperation. I think that will be the only way to efficiently um, reach the SDGs and to not start thinking what SDG is more important to reach because they're all equally relevant and important and need um, cross-cutting implementation. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, uh, Manu, we look forward to giving. Hearing... Question, if I may, very quickly as a follow up. Yeah, yeah, sure, for sure. Who's, who's speaking? To Hi there, yeah. My name is Dan Rycroft. I'm uh, working for the University of East Anglia in the UK. All right. Uh, I chair the India then. Dialogue, so greetings to everybody. Uh, Svenja, I thought it was very interesting, and I like your integrated approach to resolving these issues. Um, I wanted to highlight this question. I mean, to what extent are the principles that underpin the UN's Agenda 2030 also prevalent in people's minds. Uh, there are these five principles. One of them obviously is planetary justice, environmental justice. Um, does this feature as strongly in uh, policy and action uh, as the specific targets of the SDGs? Um, 
from what I can tell in the in the work in the parliament, um, this is underlying work. And what I'm seeing in, in the commission and the guidelines they have set themselves, um, it, it's a basis. And they're they're trying to have policy coherence by navigating it in, in all parts. And of course, some legislation will feed into it more um, than others. Uh, but to give uh, an example from the area where I'm working in, uh, especially is the trade policy, um, we see all those kind of aspects. Um, for example, we see a lot of um, um, ensuring that uh, benefits from trade as well um, takes gender perspective into account, uh, enabling more participation of uh, all genders. Um, we see as well um, cross-cutting way of uh, not only having trade and sustainable development chapters addressing that, um, but also trying to cross-cut and uh, enhance um, trade, for example, more in recycled goods. Um, so from, from the parliamentary work, uh, I can say, yes, we're doing that. Uh, an aspect from the commission, it's hard to say because we have yet not seen enough actual legislation coming from the commission, uh, because since they have been in work, um, basically they started uh, doing the COVID emergency measures and not so much actual legislation that is only starting um, to pick up. Thank you very much, and also congratulations on organizing this event. Uh, thank you, Mr. Croft. Uh, we look forward uh, for, for, um, for this meeting in the future. Uh, Uday, I think the MP has some issue, uh, some broadband issue, so you can go on with the panel discussion. He's going to join right. later. Can I yeah, also sure. ask a question, um, maybe? Or is it, or should we take it in the chat box? Uh, you, you can go ahead. Who, who wants to ask a question, sir? Uh, Marius Oche here from. Oh, Marius, yeah, go on. And then yep. we've got Mahendra Jadeja question as well. There are two questions. Any more questions? Could you raise your hand, please? Th there's an option where you can raise your hand. Oh, sorry, I didn't see this. Button. That's fine. Marius, okay. you can go ahead. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, great. Thank you very much. Uh, much. Uh, Marius here from VDA, German Association of the Automotive Industry. I'm heading a development cooperation project with our Indian sister associations. And I wanted to congratulate also Svenja to the great speech and wanted to ask as um, you highlighted very much the approach on, on trade cooperation also when it comes to climate and environmental issues and uh, also that this can be included in an FTA in the future. I just wanted to, to hear about your, your personal view how, how many steps we are still away from a free trade agreement from your perspective between India and Germany and uh, between India and Europe, sorry. And uh, because we as, as, as the German automotive industry, we would be very much um, in, in favor for a free trade agreement in future. But it's a discussion I think we are having since, I don't know, probably since decades, probably since, um, yeah, at least since some years. So I would be very much interested on your views on that as I also know that it's not the parliament doing the negotiations, but maybe what do you think? Will there be any new steps in May, for example? Uh, I hope so. Um, to be perfectly honest, I think we're still quite a bit away from, from uh, starting oh. negotiations on a free trade agreement. Um, this is partially because of different expectations about what should be covered in a free trade agreement. Um, but uh, in the follow-up of uh, the uh, RCEP conclusions, uh, we've been hearing signals from India that there's now more interest in, in working on, on trade agreements, uh, which I think is a very positive signal um, because we should um, cooperate together. We're one of the biggest economies in the world. And uh, I think it, uh, it would be better if we work on that because quite honestly, trade is happening, but if it's happening without a free trade agreement, it's happening at the, well, basic conditions. Um, and there could be so much more um, benefit to, to our partners. Um, so um, I'm curious to see if maybe um, talks and negotiations will pick up maybe more towards uh, investment um, agreement um, uh, as a step before a free trade agreement. Thank you, Marius. I think we've got Judy too, who has a question. Yeah, thank you very much. And also, um, thank you, uh, Svenja Han, for your really interesting inputs. Uh, my name is Judith Weinberger-Singh. I'm 
currently locked in from New Delhi and I'm the Associate Director of an organization called European Business and Technology Center. And we implement a business support to the EU India Policy Dialogues project and are also closely involved in implementing the Clean Energy and Climate Partnership here. Um, so my question is um, a very quick one, it's just your opinion or some, some reactions from your side. Uh, which role could or at least should um, the upcoming EU India summit play when it comes to further strengthening the ongoing um, strategic cooperation on, on green economy and, and climate change between the EU and, and India? Do you see any low hanging fruits to kind of uh, utilize the summit in this regard? Thank you very much. That's a really important question. Um, I don't see so many actually low hanging fruits, but I see the relevance on a start talking about um, how are we actually um, working to implement this um, the strategic partnership. Um, it's going from 2020 to 25. And to combat climate change, we have actually quite some instruments in it. We have the Clean Energy and Climate Partnership. And that it should be implemented through different partnerships again. Uh, we have the partnership on, on resource efficient, efficiency and circular economy. And uh, we have the water partnership and we have the partnership on smart and sustainable organization. Um, so I really hope that uh, there's gonna be more information on how it's planned to, to bring this into action. Um, especially um, on, on a technological level and exchange level and how we can benefit from each other's knowledge and technology where we heard from, from the speaker before um, what, what India is already doing. Um, so I think this is gonna be really important to bring yes, some life into this um, plans and partnership um, agreements um, to, to really bring it forward. I think the, the most important thing is um, the, the transition towards this more circular and resource efficient economies as the EU is currently working on that as well. And um, what we can accelerate more forwards what's clean energy. I think this will be the most important points in, in this uh, roadmap and I hope we will see more um, life of the, uh, to the framework brought uh, from that summit. Thank you very much, Judith and Sonia. And the final question from Mr. Jadeja from London. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good morning to uh, everyone. It's, uh, it's a question to, uh, especially to the European, and um, obviously the member of parliament for the, you know, the Germany. It's, it's, uh, it's a very, very eye-opening because uh, in India, your product, is uh, whenever it comes to the you know whether it's a solar power or anything that I think is uh, you are the one of the you know the top engineering firms comes from the Germany. What what we, what is your you know the roadmap to currently uh, most of the countries including India wanted to do the you know electric vehicle and electric vehicle is a key part of it to, you know therefore. Uh, uh, you know the batteries and X Y Z. Do you have any roadmap either from the European side or. Uh, uh, Germany said that how often uh, you wanted to take this, uh, you know, the opportunity to India and what are your thoughts and uh, what are your view and how, uh, when you are likely to take your delegation as the many, many people approach me that, you know, that they're very much interesting on this uh, uh, clean and green uh, energy, you know, uh, especially for the vehicle. Uh, can I have your thoughts on uh, inside information if any? Um, electric vehicles is uh, one of the biggest uh, discussions uh, we're having. Um, there's not a clear um, goal of an amount of electric vehicles that should be in the EU. Some member states have uh, have uh, quotas planned for that, but in the EU in general, it's regulated over the amount of pollution that um, car fleets from specific producers are allowed to have. So it's uh, taking a hard look at the overall pollution rate of, uh, of the car fleet. So they need to have a lot of electric cars um, to meet the ever going lower goals. Um, so that means at the moment they have to, to go with uh, electric cars, but in general, um, it, uh, it's important that it's not only narrowed down on electric cars, but other technologies like e-fuels um, or, um, I'm not coming up with the English word for uh, Wasserstoff, 
hydrogen um, is, um, is, is, is technology open regulation. Um, nonetheless, there's a huge debate on how to make electric cars more sustainable. There's a huge debate in a lot of policy uh, framework that we're having. For example, we're having a discussion about a due diligence regulation for supply chains uh, um, that are, is coming up in June as a proposal from the commission where it's talked about the, the raw materials that are needed to produce uh, batteries and electric cars um, because there worries about the way those uh, minerals are uh, mined um, and, and the labor conditions there are mined. So we're, we're going to expect a regulation coming up on that area. Um, and um, so it's, it's tackled in, in a lot of aspects. It's tackled on the way as well on, on energy. Um, because a lot of the energy we have in the EU so far is, uh, is not clean. Um, energy policy is not an EU task. Energy policy is a task of the member states. So we have very different approaches. My member state, Germany, for example, um, is uh, leaving uh, nuclear power, is leaving uh, coal power, wants to leave gas power and go all sustainable. Other member states, for example, um, still have a focus on, on uh, nuclear power. So they're very different approaches to energy and uh, really creating clean energy uh, for electric cars is the, is the biggest um, task uh, um, in the EU. I hope I could a bit uh, answer uh, your question. It's like a very broad topic, uh, e-cars uh, for the EU. Yeah, it, is, it, it is a broad topic, but it is, uh, you know, the key part because you, you know the United Kingdom is uh, by 2025, they want to do, you know, the key things and uh, obviously we have uh, the hype a friend of mine is, is also joined um, uh, here and uh, uh, he's and his team is uh, very much in um, uh, hydro, 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 hydrogen uh, you know that you mentioned about it there's the other key things there but uh, many many questions asked for the electric vehicle electric vehicle and I thought it would be a right question from you being from come from Germany and you have a uh, many many you know the things are coming up so no you have a you know that there are a lot of things to look at it obviously after the you know the consumption of the battery uh what is the, you know the plan for the you know the disposal of the battery as well so it's not just only the creating the battery but it's the disposal of the battery is a key part of it and never ever thought about it and uh, although it's, it's going ahead so it's a, it's a kind of a uh, very you know the top agenda for everyone there so i thought i ask you and uh, you have answered it whatever the way you did it is uh, i thank you very much for your yeah. time well thank you mr jadej and thank you svenya um i think mr ramred is mr ramred i don't think he's in he's got problem so let uh, is that is that the case arun yeah um i don't see uh, mr ramred garu uh, online at the moment and as per sujit's message uh, we might want to um wait for him to come on board because of broad, some broadband issues on his side. Sure, sure, no problem. So whenever he comes, we pause the panel discussion and he, he will give his um, brief insight. Sure. Um, Svenja, thank you very much for your great speech, your your knowledge on climate and, and green economy and, and also answering those questions that are very helpful to all the panelists and the delegates that are attending. So we thank now you so much for having me. Have a good rest conference. Thank you. thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Solankiji, for staying through the period. I know you're traveling somewhere, but uh, thank you for staying. So we now move on to the next stage, which is the panel discussion, which would be um, delegated by Mr. Bhattula. So Arun, it's all up. It's all down to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Councillor uh, Aryan. It's indeed a pleasure. Um, a word about me, I am also a vice chair at European Center for Business Industry and run a boutique management consulting forum out of uh, India and uh, Europe. I would uh, be leading the discussion with four of our 40 under 40 leaders, two of, uh, three of them from the 2019 class and uh, one of them from the uh, 20. 20 class, uh, great leaders, great work demonstrated. And some of these people have uh, been working on the areas where the questions have recently come and the policies are getting framed as well. So I would, um, the discussions would be roughly for about 30 minutes. 
And um, uh, I request uh, each one of the uh, speakers to briefly introduce about your current project and then get to the question. Uh, I will start with um, Sylvia Diwan from our 2019 class of 40 under 40 uh, leaders, future leaders, who is the founder of Sweep Smart, an organization that helps uh, manage waste better and has done wonderful work in India as well, apart from Netherlands. Um, and um, the other uh, panelists are Adam Savitz, Managing Director of uh, Xantia. Uh, great work um, being delivered across in leading change at scale. Uh, welcome on board, uh, Adam, I'll come to you. Sumit, uh, Adam is from 2019 class as well. And uh, Sumit Kabra, Director of RR Global from 2020 class. And um, um, the group is doing, RR Global groups done a lot of wonderful things uh, in um, the traditional manufacturing uh, sector and is pioneering innovation in green um, economies. And he will be bringing in a few aspects from there. And the group's uh, chairperson uh, is also a Padma Shri. So we will hear something about the values from them also. Then um, Kaushal Shah, the, um, he is the founder of um, uh, Envopath from the UK, I would, um, from the 2019 batch. So welcome on board. Uh, let's uh, start with um, Sylvia Duan. Sylvia, with a brief introduction of your current projects, can you also tell us, um, being a EU company which specializes in waste management, like um, work in India, can you give an introduction, uh, what do you call, how do you explain the work which you're doing? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you very much for, for having me and inviting me on this on this panel. I'm, I feel very honored and it's, uh, it's very interesting to join this discussion. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm Sylvia, I'm the founder of Sweep Smart. Um, we are indeed a Dutch Indian company, so we have a mother companies in, in the Netherlands, but a daughter company in Bangalore. And our mission is to create zero waste ecosystems in upcoming economies uh, that uh, uh, make economic sense, that serve the community, that save the environment, and that create jobs to be proud of. So it's not just about the environment, it's also about the waste workers. Um, and if you look at what we are good at is being a Dutch uh, Indian company, uh, we are really good in bringing the best of two worlds together. So we, we have a team with uh, people that have extensive experience in uh, waste management in Europe. Uh, so very broad expertise of best practices uh, of waste management there. But then in order for it to work in a country like India, we believe you kind of need to reinvent it uh, to, in, order to, in order to make it work in a local context. And that's really what we are, what we are good at. That's in our DNA. And if you look at what we have done, uh, we have exp extensive experience in setting up waste uh, collection and sorting systems, uh, mostly in India. Uh, we've also done a project in Indonesia and we just started in Ghana. So our work is quite scalable to other countries, but most of our experience is in India, uh, Bangalore, Delhi, uh, Chennai, uh, Gajabat. And uh, so we've set up 11 waste sorting facilities uh, to date uh, with five more coming up uh, uh, in a short time. Um, and uh, what we can do is we can do everything from consulting to turnkey delivery of the systems. Um, and that also includes training, maintenance and service. So we're sure that when we leave, uh, the organization can run the facility in, in a proper way, uh, but we can also be involved to help them achieve even higher levels of, of efficiency and ways of working. Um, yeah, and that's, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief. That's also, I think, the value that we bring uh, to India. Uh, we're, we're here to build a modern and efficient waste sector, also focusing on efficiency and qual quality health, safety and environment standards. So I think this is, this is also very important that uh, I, mean, I think India still needs to take that leap uh, towards becoming, uh, yeah, becoming more efficient, but also looking at the working standards of, of the people that are, that are missing with the waste. And that's for us uh, very important as well. 
Thank you very much. Very, very valid points about India needing to take a further leap and also uh, the uh, aspects of uh, being uh, the need to adapt into the Indian uh, yeah. uh, what you call working condition and organization structures and uh, the way work gets executed here. Apart from these, um, um, uh, what do you see are the other main inhibitors for not only the yeah. progress for sweeps, but the other similar work? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think uh, uh, what we see is in a country like India, and it's, by, by the way, very good that you say you need to make a further leap because so many good things are already happening. Uh, the first time we came to India, we were impressed uh, by the movement from the top. So what uh, uh, the, the Clean India mission, uh, uh, the smart cities, etc., etc. So that there is really a will to do something about this. And also the movement from the bottom. So there are so many great NGOs and citizens initiatives and social enterprises that are really trying to, 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 to come up with solutions that work on ground. Uh, and that's also where we see that we would like to play a role because I think the governments that want to do something often do not really know the right solutions yet, although I think a lot of great stuff is already happening in India. Uh, and it has to be invented in a way because it cannot be done like it, like it is done in Europe in that sense. So I think that's an imbi an inhibitor where we, where we play a role. And then for, but what we do see is that the sector is still nascent. So it's really in development. Uh, and that means that uh, it's also underfunded, uh, both in CAPEX as well as OPEX. So uh, in waste management, unfortunately, the waste on an average doesn't have enough value to be just responsibly co uh, collected and processed. So you need collection fees, uh, taxes, uh, something like that. Uh, so I think that's, that's still a, a main challenge that we see, uh, even on running the systems and then, of course, also on building the system. So on the front, front side in terms of, uh, in terms of CapEx. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's where you need organizations that will stick their neck out. And this can be municipalities, but I think also some of the brand owners are stepping up, like Coca-Cola, who has invested in a big fund to set up uh, plastic waste management systems. Uh, yeah, because this sector is still so young, it needs some more kickstarting uh, uh, funding, I would say. And then it also needs to discover, so we sometimes see that, that there are still choices made for kind of very, uh, like a little bit the two penny wise pound foolish solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, so choosing like very, very uh, um, cost effective uh, equipment, but which then in the end doesn't turn out to work or just buying the equipment, but not thinking about consulting around it. And how do you train the people to actually use the equipment properly? So I think that's, that's it's part of a sector that's still uh, growing up and a lot of good stuff is, stuff is happening as well, I would say. Great. Um, thanks a lot for uh, the inhibitors. Very, very well um, articulated. Um, we did uh, talk about the inhibitors now because you are delivering the work and you might have sent some early stimulus, uh, stimulus that keeps working. So have you seen any of these that will uh, give you belief, not only in yes. India, but across the world also. Yes, no, absolutely. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. And I think India is really a front runner uh, uh, in, in many respects, but the rest of the rest of the world is following. And I think I, I already touched upon it briefly, but I, I do think that uh, the Swatch Bharat mission, uh, the smart cities, uh, the, the solid waste management rules and the plastic waste management rules, uh, also the fact that the National Green Tribunal is playing, a, playing an active role yeah, it's it's making a difference. Eh? We, I, I think you can see that that uh, that this spurs um, 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 action, basically. And I think what I find very fascinating in India that I think a lot of this is also driven by bottom up initiatives eh? by citizens eh? in, in Bangalore. There's a group of citizens that, that started a court case against Bangalore municipality. And that's why so many changes have happened in the city. Uh, so I think the interplay between the top down and the bottom up is in India, I think uh, very interesting with all these grassroots initiatives also doing a lot of good work. And then what I hope that will be a game changer. And I think we are already seeing that now is that the plastics industry um, is voluntarily moving uh, so they are starting uh, 
uh, to invest in, in projects in waste management. There's uh, internationally the alliance to end plastic waste uh, from the uh, large plastic manufacturers that is investing heavily in waste management infrastructure across the world. Uh, Circulate capital, capital there's, there's quite a few other ones as well. Um, and uh, related to that, I think there's, of course, also not only the voluntary voluntary movement, but also the more uh, legal uh, uh, route that's being taken, which is extended producers responsibility. Uh, so this is uh, where, the, where the plastics uh, producers or brand owners are being held responsible for the plastic waste that they uh, send into the system and they actually need to get it back. And that relates also back to what I was saying in terms of the underfunded sector. Uh, EPR can play a big role in uh, closing the gap, uh, like the economic viability gap um, that is there uh, to make sure that it becomes economically viable to collect these plastics. Uh, and that's also a role that we then see in bringing it, this together because this, as I mentioned before, the sector does still need to grow. Mm -hmm. So where uh, the, the plastic producers and brand owners could fund the infrastructure, uh, the government needs to support it, of course, because it is always uh, related to government uh, waste management. And then local organizations can run it and we can help uh, set, set them up. Amazing. So you did um, uh, touch about these, uh, what do you call, positive stimulus that's happening on the, the front, uh, policy making front, the law uh, compliance that is uh, needed and also from the citizens movements that are happening where um, earlier on um, the uh, MPs also said that it needs to be individual than yes. national uh, yeah. what do you call, uh, multilateral and bilateral so individually also it's starting um, tough uh, it's a uh, nascent sector uh, <laughs> uh, and this is where I would like to call in Adam Savitz who is an expert in change management and scaling the change uh, the, and impact. So uh, welcome on board, um, Adam. And um, I would like you to briefly introduce um, Xantio and about leading change at scale. So like the issues of, um, can we uh, help? Yeah, over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you guys and Sylvia, excellent kind of intro there. Um, so we, I work for Zinte, I'm a managing director and it's been great to be part of this group for a number of years now. Uh, we uh, work in the, U in, in the EU and now I'm in the UK, so technically outside the EU, um, but we work on a program called Europe Delivers and we also have a program in India called India 2022. Uh, that is a program where we have brought together companies and leaders like uh, Hindustan Unilever, SBI, WPP, Hindalco, Science, Shell um, and others. And very much what we believe in as an organization is to reinvent growth. Uh, the way we have been working for the last 150 years has been great uh, from a capital perspective, but unfortunately it has not benefited everyone. It benefited the environment. The separation between the few and the many has kind of grown. And also we have a perpetual kind of short-termist view in everything we do at the moment. So we work with business leaders uh, to help them change their mindsets, uh, who in turn work within their businesses and then within the systems that they operate. So the wicked problems that exist out there, the truly systemic challenges that Sylvia just alluded to, particularly in the waste sector, but also in India with Hindalco on sustainable mining. And yes, I use the word sustainable mining. I know it's a controversial topic. Um, but equally with Scient, the Hyderabad-based organization on affordable diagnostic healthcare equipment. There are so many opportunities out there to tackle some of the biggest challenges in the world that exist and actually make a commercial return from it. What we're seeing around the world is, is, is an amazing opportunity. We have no time. We literally have no time. 2030, the 55% reduction in European uh, greenhouse gas emissions is nine years away. We're already planning the Olympics for 2032. How the hell are we going to decarbonize the whole of the EU in that short period of time? We also have these incredible policy and monetary stimulus on the table at the moment. We have the European Green Deal, which is, you know, as Diedrich Samson will say, more cash available now than there has ever been in history. The Chancellor in the UK next week is going to announce in the UK budget, the National Infrastructure Bank more money that's going to go to infrastructure projects than has ever been before. And so we have this real opportunity to leverage private finance, which they all want. 
work with businesses to truly transform systems, to electrify the whole of the EU, to bring um, that learning to India. Uh, I was saying to Aaron before, I've probably been to India, I don't know, 50 times before COVID in the last couple of years. And I come back to the UK and think we might as well give up here. The scale of the challenge and the opportunity that exists in India compared to the UK, we're just a scratch, pure scratch, you know, on the surface of the kind of the opportunity that exists. And what we're trying to do is leverage our idea of collaboration. The only way we're going to succeed in tackling some of these real systemic challenges is to work collaboratively across industry, but also um, across other stakeholders, working with government, working with, you know, um, civil society and others and this is kind of what we do we bring um, individuals and companies together in a collaborative way to try and tackle the systemic challenges that exist and look at not the thing up here which is we think is the problem but try and understand the systemic change down here which actually then feeds up into the whole system um, so we are very 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 excited there is no time. It's like a poker game where we're all in. As John Kerry said recently about COP, you know, this is our last best chance to actually do something. And so we're working with enlightened leaders in business to try and actually make that action happen. And as one of the CEOs said to us recently, he's had enough of pilot projects. We need to kind of move to scale, um, but that isn't easy. Amazing, and this is this is always a, what you call an issue when uh, the CEOs make strategic decisions, and especially in strategic uh, programs, on when to move uh, from pilots to the actual um, putting the entire organization into the pain of a strategic transformation. So, um, what do you think are the opportunities? Given you you did mention that um, there is cash, and um, I'm so uh, what do you think are the kind of opportunities that UK and EU present to India so that this they can reduce this pain of transformation? Um, yeah. I, I, wish, I wish there was a, you know, a key that could just turn that, open that door, but um, there is a huge challenge. You know, there has never been more money available. All the technology actually exists mm. about putting the right things in the right place at the right time, and then also considering the behavioral science piece of it. You can have you know, the perfect solution, but put in the wrong place and it just doesn't work. One of the things we've experienced, and um, I, I mentioned this to you, Aaron, but I joined a um, EU delegation to India on waste management a few years ago. And people across 16 European countries came to India with what they believed was a diamond printing machine. Their technology, their solution was perfect. And they had it here and they were like, buy this off me. It's like, you know, you print diamonds effectively. Um, and the response they always got, and this is the same response that, you know, Sanjeev Mehta at Hindustan Unilever would also say to us, you know, India is not a homogeneous country. So trying to find a solution that fits the whole country and it up is just impossible as everyone said. But equally the response they always get is, well, where's this been trialed in India? And they're all you know, frustrated by the fact that, well, we haven't yet, this is why we're here. And then they, you know, if they get past that question, then it's where has it been trialed at scale? And so they're all like, well, obviously it hasn't sort of thing. Eh? And so there's this kind of challenge that exists with you know, amazing technology. It comes back to kind of the EV point before in terms of electric cars and battery technology and everything like that. Um, what has to happen somewhere in that system is either someone takes a risk on a technology that you know could be you know, the diamond printing machine for any industry or whatever it is, um, or you know all the masses of engineering that exist in the country uh, and you know innovation and everything else that's coming that has to somehow scale. And lots of people put lots of money in to kind of do things like that. But what we believe is if we were to get you know the whole of the CPG industry to not just go and buy extended producer responsibility credits. Mm -hmm. Fantastic announcement from Sanjeev Mehta and Hindustan Union today on being uh, waste neutral. But we need to go a step further. There's really kind of systemic challenges in there. And one of the things we did was uh, we, we produced a, um, a education series for children to, to let them know that you can even recycle plastic. Let alone, you know, that's not a kind of concept that you would kind of initially know. So then you need the infrastructure in place and everything else. So 
we need all of that. We need it very, very quickly um, in order for us to kind of tackle some of these challenges. And the way we believe we do that is we bring these massive behemoth organizations together and say, yeah. The Tartars work with the billers, work with Reliances and others to actually, you know, formulate a plan and give us your people, your money, your ideas, your technology, your space and everything like that. And we'll help catalyze and ignite and push that collaboration. Right, Adam, that energy is needed a lot. And um, thanks for the inspiration and uh, giving the confidence that it can be done. Um, I One last point before I move on to uh, Subit Kabra. Um, and Sumit definitely is trying to tackle uh, the EV as well as uh, the education uh, sector together, uh, the group. So uh, before that, uh, net zero ambitions and goals of the UK, how can um, India benefit from that or benefit at scale from that? A moment if you can take for that. Well, our um, Alex Sharma, the head of COP and the UK minister was in India two weeks ago. Um, and he is pushing, obviously, for India for, to set a net zero ambition target, um, which, is, you know, is difficult to do. Um, and like I say, with, you know, whatever we invest today puts us in a trajectory to 2030 or 2050. What they're talking about with all of this money is infrastructure projects or electrifying the whole of Europe or the whole of India, you know, in order to be able to use electric network or EV vehicles, for example. The decisions we make today lock us into a trajectory for 2030 and way beyond because yeah. of the size of the, the infrastructure and the investment that's made. So the question we keep challenging the EU and, and challenge UK government laws, who's thinking systemically about this? Who's thinking that if we invest here, here and here, it all adds up to the sectorial decarbonisation targets and, and aspirations we're all looking for? So you know it's not a sort of you know think about this in five years time it's like today and so i think the thing that we can kind of learn and and, and certainly um translate systemic, how are the eu going to kind of crack that and then how can they kind of take that to you know a, a country with you know many many states and you know bigger and equivalent to kind of the eu in terms of you know governance and kind of challenge because the EU Green Deal is going to pay that money out to 27 member states who are then going to pay it to different businesses and elsewhere. And that sounds very familiar with regard to kind of what's going to happen in India as well. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, now we have seen um, Sylvia Devon's um, interventions and experiments in um, creating change to the systemic um, change and scaling that your methods and um, attempts have been with the Indian industry. And I'd like to go to um, Sumit Kabra, the director of RR Global from our class of 2020. Sumit, can you hear me please? Yeah, hi. yeah good evening, yeah. Very good evening, Sumit. Yeah. Sumit, can you briefly highlight RR Global's portfolio of businesses and uh, the new strategic transformation you're currently executing? Uh, thanks, Arun and Sujit and everyone, the panelists here. It's an honor and privilege to be here with all of them. Uh, well, uh, Hara Global is one of the largest electrical conglomerate. Uh, we are known for copper in India. So uh, whatever India produces or like the consumes, 7% of the copper we consume in Hara Global. Well, it's in a different form altogether. We are into wires and cables. Uh, we are into magnet wires. We are into copper tubes, copper bus bars. So any product related to copper, so when we say people are known as a brand in B2C, we say we are brand in C2C, that is anything in okay. copper, any consumer. So that's the way we say in India. Uh, we are also into multi-level car parking systems, uh, which provide the industry majority. And uh, recently we ventured into electric scooter as well. Okay. Well, uh, we have around 12 plants in India, uh, one plant in Bangladesh as well. And the latest uh, before six months or one year, we started a plant in Dubai as well for making a bus ducting system. So we have a decent presence in India as well as in Bangladesh, Burma, and Middle East. This is what, what we do in India. Great. Thanks for the introduction. And um, now, uh, what do you see is the future of electric mobility? According, um, and um, do you think uh, India would be one of the fastest adapting uh, countries uh, given, uh, I can we take the example of uh, smartphone adoption, the pace compared? Arun, uh, 
why why only smartphones let it be anything like you know we we have started adopting the change whatever it, it, it's been uh, necessary and the solar industry mm -hmm. let it be smartphones so before five years we used to import phones now it's something like you know we are exporting around 30 million phones every year this is right. kind of uh, uh, technology adaptation India has done and the, to be very frank the government has supported a lot for encouraging this so there has been of course uh, there's been a paradigm shift India is known as now a trusted exporter there's a shift in last five years so this is something amazing of course we are seeing the same paradigm shift in scooters as well getting from gasoline to electric scooters uh, because the government is pushing for it at the same time the benefit what you see per scooter saving you get the returns within uh, within three years, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. So it has yeah. changed thanks to the petrol gas prices going up to 100 rupees in India, which is supporting a lot comparatively for pushing it more faster. So Indian yeah. economy, you know, MSME supports 30% of the GDP where the people work. And this is where the target for us as well as an audience. So looking at, you know, uh, so much big population and converting this all scooters, it may take time, but the government has taken a deadline of by 2024 or 2024, getting converted the whole gasoline scooters into electric scooters. Yeah, Sumit, so, um, there is a hot stop for uh, Kaushal, uh, who uh, would like to step out for a very important meeting. He's logged in from London. Uh, Kaushal, uh, I'll come back to you, Sumit, for a couple more questions. Kaushal Shah is, is good. Uh, from uh, yeah, 2020, uh, 2019 class and does wonderful work uh, based out of UK in uh, creating uh, products which don't use trees at all. And they are the products that are there on your table, including paper. So um, Kaushal Shah from Envopap. Um, Kaushal, come on board. And uh, can you tell us how Envopap uh, fits in with the current discussions of EU-India relations and how do you um, contribute towards the development of uh, the circular economy? Uh, firstly, thank you so much, Arun, uh, for the kind introduction and thank you, EICBI, for inviting. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, so a quick introduction. Uh, we are Envopap. We make innovative, sustainable packaging and printing materials, which are kind to the planet by using the waste of agricultural residue, which is found in India. We use the waste of sugarcane wheat, uh, uh, rice, and sarkanda. These uh, waste fibers are usually burnt or dumped. We collect them from farmers and sugar mills and wheat mills, put, make it into pulp, and these uh, this pulp is then pressed and dried into making our packaging materials. We cater to a wider segment here, mostly focused on the food packaging or the e-commerce packaging sector or the clothing, and at the same time in the cosmetics and publishing industry. So um, our company is born in the UK. I started the business while I was pursuing my master's at the University of Southampton. And then now we have our EU HQ, which is in Frankfurt. And our all our production is uh, in India, all across India. And we work across the northern and southern segment of uh, India as well. And our main core motive is uh, to raise the standards of sustainable packaging and help brands create wealth uh, for the world from the waste we generate in India. And as you know, uh, as a business uh, which is headquartered in the UK, uh, our materials are then recycled and composted in the UK and EU. And both our materials and our business is very much circular and in nature. And our teams are very much multicultural with our bases all across EU, UK, and India as well. And we have, you know, been here for the last six years, and we've been partnering with a lot of local organizations, um, such as multiple, you know, universities in the UK, such as right. University of Bath or University of Southampton, Surrey, Southampton is my alma mater. And we've been looking to uh, make products in the UK where our materials come from India, we make our end products for the packaging sector here, and then sell it to our clients, which then get recycled or composted in the UK or, or EU as well. So we're closing the loop by using the waste in India. Uh, which was a big problem uh, with waste management of agricultural waste and then creating products into the European region and selling them all across EU and UK as well. And it's been great in the last three years with the UK collaboration. Uh, the progress has been great and I uh, do look, uh, uh, I, I can see that uh, there are prospects brighter as well. But what have been the lessons so far? You have multiple collaborations across EU now, uh, the UK and India. So any lessons that uh, you might want to share, which might help um, Adam and um, people like Sylvia and all of us? So 
So, uh, you know, our business uh, model and our materials are uh, given a much warmer reception than I would say a much larger, uh, you know, greater consideration as well in the UK and European mm -hmm. uh, business segment. And uh, being headquartered in the UK and close proximity to the EU, uh, we have inculcated global standards in our Indian operations as well. And, you know, being a British company and being a certified B corporation helps with a strong commitment to balance our purpose, which is raising the bar of packaging and, you know, uh, balance our purpose and the planet alongside with obvious profit because we are a profitable organization making money for our shareholders but working together with our partners like founders factory which is one of the largest accelerators here in london uh, the london waste and recycling board where we look at collaboration on how can we look at innovative ways of making our materials decompose into uh, you know get uh, uh, close the loop the end of life and then working with partners like such squared which is a collaboration of five universities uh, where we are using their labs, we are conducting trials, we are innovating with making new chemical uh, chemicals which can be applied on a part materials and then working with the London and partners and being in the mayor's international program where we get a huge amount of support from a partnership opportunities while it's not just getting customers but also companies and partnerships where we can collaborate together to, to you know reach our goal. And uh, you know, partners here are all open, all about collaboration. And that's one thing which is a huge lesson because at the end of the day, we these partners have helped us in all the way from conceptualization to collaborating to marketing of our products and helping with, you know, the mostly finding greater options for closing the end of the loop and which contribute to our circular economy. I think, uh, you know, and then uh, we need to now look at greater collaboration opportunities within the UK and EU and India towards contribution towards uh, circular economy. Thanks a lot, Kaushal. That brings in very, very positive vibes from the Founders Factory and similar kinds of clusters and partners, which are, I am exp I'm guessing that they're in the private and uh, sector uh, or uh, the um, collaborations that are happening in between entrepreneurs. But uh, do you have any suggestions for what governments at the EU and the national level and in, including the UK can do to um, create even further, uh, give even further impetus for uh, the sustainable economy and the green economy? Thank you. That's a very interesting question. Uh, to be very honest, I, I do believe, and uh, that's my personal opinion, but I do feel that, you know, in the Western Hemisphere, we are a little bit relaxed uh, in terms of implementing milestone resolutions. And I say that because uh, I've been to Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania last year, and I've traveled a couple of times. The first thing when I landed at Kigali International Airport was they checked my bag if I had plastic bags. And in the EU, nor in the UK, we don't have any, uh, my, you know, any uh, rules such as where we are banning plastic bags, which are so widely utilized all the way from our Tesco's to, you know, wherever we go, there's a plastic bag. Of course, consumers don't want to use such you know, products and they're using, moving to more reusable bags. But I think it, it does involve uh, governmental resolution uh, in putting up a new policy. But I, I, I do feel, you know, on, uh, there has been some good development happening under the Basel Convention as well, which is aiming to make uh, the export of plastic to poorer countries uh, more transparent, uh, where the objective was to allow developing countries like uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, to refuse low quality or the plastic materials, which were difficult to recycle before it is being shipped out of you know, UK or EU. And the UK packaging tax as well, which is great, which applies to you know plastic packaging produced in or imported into the UK that does not contain at least 30% recycled plastic. So uh, there have been you know uh, good uh, initiatives being taken with the EU's ban coming next year for the plastic uh, cotton bar stirrers. Uh, but I think we need we are far away from you know our basic products which we use on a daily basis. These are the products which need to be uh, looked in much rather detail. And given new materials which are coming out, they need to be looked at in a way where innovation is uh, being uh, generated through business opportunities. Thanks a lot, Kaushal, and thanks for taking time. Um, I, if any further questions come, we do we will pass them on by email to you and uh, share the response back to the audiences. Thank you. Uh, thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Sumit. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Sumit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we were uh, discussing about the uh, possible uh, new innovations in uh, the, um, uh, the, what do you call, green economy sector. So uh, what are the new innovations you would like to execute?
Uh, Harun, our group has been always known for that, and we have been a classic example of blue ocean strategy, where we follow all the four things, eliminate, reduce, race, and create. So we have always worked on these four things and always run the product in the market. Let it be when we started with wire and cable, we are the only one who produce unilay technology, where you have to don't uh, twist it. We give all it twisted and cut it and fit it. So we have right. one stage in that. Same way, uh, we, we also follow a policy of safety, saving, and sustainable. If these three right. things are on the right, we always work with this uh, policy for launching the product. So when it comes to reduce, we, we developed a uh, brushless DC motor technology where we converted all the fans from 75 watt to 28 watt. And we are the first one in India, you, uh, you can see on BW website. And the latest one, what we have developed is uh, light fidelity technology, where with fiber, we are able to give the internet uh, in the most rural village. So I, I, I had passed on the article, we are the first proud Indian woman, uh, which has done the internet through light fidelity uh, in two of the villages in Gujarat. And this is a amazing technology where without hindrances, you get the GBPS speed, that speed you can achieve through light fidelity. So these are the innovations on the car zone right now at Arab Global. Of course, we are working a lot on uh, electric scooter as well, but right now I cannot Sure, thanks a lot and very, very well reiterated um, fundamental aspects of uh, the green economy, savings, savings and savings and how do we minimize utilization of scarce resources and at a factor level you uh, are uh, uh, making this happen with copper and other precious metals and that again transfers uh, to the homes where the devices use less and less amount of power. Um, great. and. Uh, one uh, last question before we um, pass the open it, uh, pass it on to the other panel. Um, so, it, it is um, your group chairman um, is a Padma Shri, so um, and a strong promoter of Atmanirbhar Bharat. So, is this the reason behind entering into uh, the uh, electric scooter segment, or any other reason? And well, uh, Padma Shri was a reason for you know Arun. When you get success, it is from personal and professional goals where. Whereas the satisfaction comes from philanthropic goals. So this is a belief what we do in our family. So he was recognized as a Padma Shri for that activity. Uh, we, are, we are handling so many NGOs like Friends of Tribal Society, which has won the Gandhi Peace Award. We are in Hema Foundation. We are giving a, a model value education uh, across more than 2 lakh students. 200,000 students are getting associated with us right now. So there are a lot of things on Side, uh, so that's the reason he has been recognized uh, for Padma Shri. Well, electric scooter was a, you know, the basic reason was, you know, I don't, if you look at our group culture, we are 21 year old company in our travel. We have always proactively disrupted ourselves and as a challenge that, uh, you know, we will disrupt ourselves and find the new technology which is coming in the market. And electric has been always our base. So why not to explore that further? So we have a strength in motors, the only thing where we have to do mastery in was in the battery side, which we have done the association with our suppliers. So it's a great win-win situation. I know there are going to be many players, but with this fierce competition, if your right sustainable models are there and your backward integrations are ready, it's a great opportunity to be uh, going in this sector. And we are confident to be again in the, this sector as well in top five. Great, thanks a lot, Sumit. And uh, let me uh, also thank Mahindraji Kavra for uh, leading. I did have a couple of interactions with him. Great personality. Thank you, thank you uh, sir. Um, Sylvia and Adam, uh, would you have anything to add before? Because we're running a bit short on time. If you'd like to add, we can, and then pass it on to um, Councillor um, Aryan for the next uh, panel. No, just fantastic opportunity that exists in India, huge challenge, and we just really, really need to scale some innovation and opportunities today. Um, I'll put in the chat kind of what more we're doing in India so people who are interested, they can explore that. Plus also we just brought out a new report um, in Europe uh, where we surveyed eight CEOs, including um, Chandra at, at Tata Sons. Um, about uh, how we recover better effectively. So feel free to kind of check that one out as well. Thanks a lot, Adam. Thanks for taking time. And we look forward to a lot of more collaborations. Um, Ms. Sylvia, any uh, more yeah. points? 
Yeah, well, I think uh, I, I've been listening to the discussion. I'm, I'm really fascinated by the work that the other panelists are doing. So <laughs> that really sounds great. Uh, and and uh, happy to hear also uh, your, your words, Adam, about the systemic change, because that is really uh, what is needed. Um, and, and, and I agree uh, with the comment also that I, I get annoyed that in Europe, uh, it takes so much time to come up with any regulation to do anything about anything. And that's why it's always interesting to see both worlds because you have such a different perspective and it's, 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 it just uh, surprises me. And that's where I also learn from India and tell people about India and things that are happening there uh, to and India and Africa, you know, the, the other examples that were mentioned. And I just think we need to ex exchange more in that respect and, and learn from each other in all, in all ways. Thanks a lot, Ms. Sylvia and Adam, uh, Sumit and uh, Kaushal. We will uh, sh uh, what do you call, get to the questions if time permits or we will circulate them by email. Um, Councillor Aryan, um, I did take a little more time than was allocated, but it was an interesting discussion. Uh, can I pass it on to you, please? Councillor Aryan. Yeah, thank you, Aryan. Uh, I think we still have time for MP to come and give his speech. So we'll kick on with the next panel discussion on uh, climate change and cooperation between India, UK and the EU. So may I call Ms. Natrajan, Priyadarshini Natrajan, Associate Editor of Diplomacy and Beyond Plus magazine. So are, are you here, Priya? Good evening. Hi. Hi, hi. Okay, so may I hand Hi, over to you to run the next panel discussion? So I have right. Dr. Manu Sheshi Dharan, uh, Ms. Judith um, Weinberger Singh, Mr. Navin Medisetti, and Mr. Marus Osha. Are you, are you guys here, Paul? Yes, we are here and happy to participate. Cool, okay. It, it, it's all to you, Pridharshan. Thank you, Councillor Aryan. Uh, I'm Priya Darshnina Trajan. I'm an associate editor for Diplomacy Beyond and Plus. We are a magazine that covers issues ranging from politics to social to culture and environment. So therefore, it's great to be part of this discussion. As we know, climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our time and the consequences of the decisions that we have taken or take or fail to take are being born by us and will mainly be born by our future generations. Um, for all these reasons, uh, I'm pleased to introduce our uh, next session, which is on the climate change cooperation between India and the European Union, UK. And I would like to introduce the panelists for this session. I'll start with um, Dr. Manu Shashidharan. Thank you for your- So I'll just briefly give an Thanks. I'll just give briefly introduce you. Uh, he's an expert in transport infrastructure as durable experience of consulting for intergovernmental bodies on sustainable transport and mobility. He is currently working with the University of Cambridge as a, res a research associate in uh, infrastructure asset management to develop risk informed data centric approaches for managing critical transport infrastructure while considering wider socio-technical, economic, and environmental implications. He was also involved in applied research projects that promote sustainable access and mobile strategy to achieve sustainable development goals in both rural and uh, urban environments. So I'd like, to, I'd like you to take over right now. Thank you very much, Priya. Um, Thank you very everyone for joining. Um, so as we all know, and I don't have to state that, we know that the climate change is the biggest challenge of our times, uh, but I'm sort of trying to bring in a conversation from an infrastructure perspective. Um, infrastructure being our rails and roads, bridges, electricity, dams, anything you name, which is key for our country's economy to go forward. Um, so we need to sort of, I'm, I'm trying to bring in the fact that the physical impacts of climate change such as the extreme weather events, which are getting very frequent right now, we need to look at it, how it impacts our infrastructure as well. So trying to say that we need to ensure that the infrastructure is climate resilient, um, because that will help in reducing our disruption caused by these extreme weather events. So 
one defining characteristic of these climate resilient infrastructure, as, as it is called, is involved in the planning, designing, building, and operating in a way that the infrastructure can anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to a ch changing climate condition. So how do we do that is to do with, if we are building our new infrastructures, we need to make sure that we, the decisions that we make today are based on predictions of what happens on the implications of the decision in 20 or 30 or 40 years down the future, because that's when climate risks are planning or are going to impact us much more worsely. So I think it should be made priority that a robust um, environmental assessment needs to be conducted um, for any new development um, to get a green light. So if environment is a winner, then by default, society and economy are beneficiaries of that win. And, and decision makers needs to also have this um, access to high quality data or information to sort of make that predictions. And we do a couple of work at the University of Cambridge as well as in um, Birmingham, um, looking into how we can use better data um, for informing uh, decisions on our transport infrastructures so using satellites and things like that. But from looking at it from a climate change India angle, India has always um, sort of being, making big strides um, in that aspect, mainly through the National Action Plan on Climate Change and as well as the Disaster Management Act and Framework. However, despite the fact that there is a lot of academic understanding and, policy at, and, and, and even at a policy level, um, there is a the integration of these two different plans has not really taken place at a sub-national level or a ground action level. Um, so that's one thing which I would say that we should sort of focus from an India perspective. And, and even um, UK is going to be the first co-chair of the governing council uh, that India is leading on the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, which I'm very um, excited about this coalition, which I'm sure it will bring in a lot of um, knowledge exchange and things in the right way. And, and UK was the first major economy to sort of pass a net zero emission law. So again, conversations can happen on, um, can UK help India on framing such similar laws on, you know, those kind of uh, net zero emission laws. And to address the climate change from a different aspect, apart from the infrastructure and everything, um, is the root of the problem, which is the greenhouse gas emissions in particular. And I see um, in sort of stuff like the World Solar Bank and the International Solar Alliance, and even e-mobility to be the game changer in this particular sphere. And in India, plans are ongoing to produce about 40% of India's electricity from a non-fossil um, fuel energy resource. So there is an intent and there is a buy-in. That is half the battle won. But when it comes to such initiatives, citizen involvement is the key. And, and that is lacking at the moment is what I feel. So, because we're talking about a culture change here. So can, can, can we make Amsterdam's um, cycling culture inspire Indian citizens? Because it was not long back, we heard about Transport for London in talks with Chennai for consulting on e-mobility and electric buses. And even Sheffield is talking about um, um, collaborating with Pune on helping them on public transport and environment. And recently, Transport for London has also signed an MOU with the Indian Ministry of Roads and Highways for an overall betterment of public transport. Um, even GIZ has a very strong and growing presence in India in sort of uh, helping in that sustainable mobility area. So there is a lot of activities happening. I think something key to tackle or something key to look at would be, uh, or an idea would be to try and see if we can twin UK or EU, the European towns and cities with Indian ones for a better climate cooperation. So what do I mean by that is finding sister cities, uh, which sort of have a complementary um, culture, structure, function and problems, and then look at a knowledge exchange between these complementary cities in a more systematic and a formal way. So we know that all these individual cities contract each other and do stuff, but let's look at it from a formal perspective. Can there be um, sort of any funds that the governments can set away so that such kind of corporations are encouraged because that would open doors for not just climate cooperation from a policy perspective, but also for businesses in e-mobility, universities, think tanks, all of that. And to, I, to sort of look at it from what's happening right now, I think uh, that the EU's World Cities program is a potential framework to sort of promoting that sort of capacity building and knowledge sharing between um, the city level aspects. So that's probably how I would like to end my sort of uh, small session here. Um, final bit is to say that we're not looking for quick fixes. There's no point of quick fixes, but quick wins which have a long-term impact. Thank you. 
All right, thank you. Uh, you gave a lot of objectives which can be achieved with time. Just a few questions. Um, you had spoken about uh, data you know, being the key to making decisions. So do you think we have enough data right now? And if we do not have it, um, how do you, you know, how do we plan to collect the data? So data is important because when we are sort of predicting things into the future, mainly with climate change, like in the case of what's the impact of climate change when I am planning to make more railways than roads, for example, the quality of data is very crucial when you're sort of, sort of, you know, predicting these things. And um, the use of existing platforms and online tools, um, like for example, the European Commission has developed a couple of them and support them. Um, the Copernicus Climate Data Store, the European Climate Adapt Forum. Um, so there are a lot of data available. Um, so recently, we see that the geospatial or the satellite-based um, data is gathering a lot of attention for its capability to provide reliable data in a very quick manner. And um, Indian um, Space Research Organization has certain satellites which they have set aside for climate change sort of focused areas. So I've also been involved in some of the research and development at the University of Cambridge, which looks at using those kind of data. So there is enough data, um, there is enough tools. Probably I would say there's a lot of tools. Uh, it's, but what I feel is that though you have access to the information, it should be complemented with um, development of technical and institutional capacity to manage climate related risks at, at government as well as local levels. All right. So before I move on to the next speaker, I just have one more question. Um, uh, with the SDG to 2030 targets, how do you see EU, UK, India align their climate action targets? Um, that, that's a very um, interesting question because that's, that's quite timely as well because you see that UK is the presidency of the COP26 in 2021 and India's presidency in G20 in uh, 2023. It sort of provides important platforms for these kind of uh, global actions uh, in implementing the Paris uh, SDG agreement. And also the International Solar Alliance, which is headquartered in New Delhi, um, the India-EU water partnership. So there are a lot of um, sort of uh, bilateral partnerships which is happening. Um, I think there is there is a lot of info, there is a lot of intent in consolidating these partnerships for a global impact as well. Um, but as I said earlier, a formal framework for engagement between towns and cities at a local level um, would between Europe and India that would go a long way. Um, so, so there is an intention. There is a lot of actions that happening, um, and, and also the new um, the coalition on the disaster risk framework that also helps a lot. So. There is a lot of intention, but I think there needs to be a bit more of formalized ways of engagement in a systematic way. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, carrying this forward, I would like to introduce Mrs. Judith Weinberger Singh. Uh, she is um, Associate Director for the European Business and Technology Center. Having gathered work experience in the creative consultancy business in both Germany and India, she has gained valuable insights into the perspectives and multi-layer challenges European companies face when entering the Indian market. So at UDTC, her role involves coordinating and managing activities linked to EBTC's programs and from stakeholders from the European Union and India. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and for having me here. It has been quite interesting so far. I've been listening carefully and um, just to add on to the introduction. So I am currently, as I mentioned before, I'm here in New Delhi. I've been here for the last five years and um, our organization um, the European Business and Technology Center actually emerged as an idea from the European Parliament um, in 2008. I should have mentioned that probably when uh, Svenja Hahn was still on the call, um, but that was uh, the, the starting point of this, uh, of this organization that really has the mandate to enable Europe-India collaboration in different areas. And our key mandate um, that we still pursue as a today not-for-profit entity is um, to, to not just focus on business collaborations or overall um, economic ties that we can foster as this facilitation agency, but uh, doing that with a particular focus on, 
on sustainable and, and green technologies and on solutions that are based upon a holistic perspective, which implies again, the principles of the economy, of circular economy and, um, and beyond. So that's the key target and that's also my perspective um, with uh, which I've been listening to the discussion um, because our focus is or my focus is always to kind of translate the, the regulatory and policy dimensions into actionable frameworks and structures that um, businesses can use, can eventually use and, 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 uh, and um, set up actionable frameworks for themselves. That is simply put, uh, ex accessing the market in India um, more effectively um, and also providing solutions to the challenges that, that might be here in, in different sectors that address climate change. Yeah, and I think probably that's already enough for the introduction. I don't want to take too much of um, time. So uh, as an enabler for uh, the Europe-India collaboration, how does your organization um, you know, support businesses in the sphere of climate change related to sectors or areas in India? Um, that's a, a good question. And um, it's probably, again, uh, it to an extent also responds to what uh, Manu has just shared that we do really require um, a more formalized frameworks in which we can exchange best practices through which we can work together more effectively and, and with a stronger focus. And, and that's also the kind of principle um, on the basis of which we are working. And um, we do implement a couple of EU funded projects, uh, one of which is called the business support to the EU India policy dialogues project um, and that very project has as I mentioned before the objective to um, to really use the ongoing policy dialogues between um, the strategic partners that is the EU and India in areas where there are already ongoing policy dialogues and if we look at the current strategic partnership between the EU and India then most of it is pretty much in line with those um, topics that we are discussing today, that is climate uh, change, climate action, um, as well as uh, green economy. And uh, EBTC is then coming here into the picture by really designing activities um, and frameworks where business can come together in, in, in form of clusters, for example, um, that tackle some challenges in a very demand-driven way. So we would identify what are the, the, the challenges on the ground and then how can that be um, tackled by um, joining hands and by bringing in um, what's already there and adapting it to the local, local circumstances. Um, so simply put, there are three pillars um, that are really important um, in terms of yeah, making climate change measures visible on the ground and that's the, te the technology dimension. Um, and of course, when, go, when venturing into India from, from Europe, then you have to adapt the technology, you have to understand in which kind of um, scenarios you can apply it and, and assure financial viability. And here comes the second point, the, the financing um, is really important. Uh, and there's still scope for improvement. So also here we're trying to build some bridges and uh, have come up with a, with a corporate finance forum um, to, to kind of map those gaps and, and ensure that whatever solutions that um, might be a bit costly at the first sight, but have a clear value in terms of um, sustainability and resource efficiency, that they also um, assure economic as well as commercial viability. And the third part is then related to business models. It's not only disruptive technologies that can solve um, climate change issues or prevent um, climate change, mitigate that, but we also have to come up with disruptive business models that, um, that can make a difference. And sometimes it means that you just take what, whatever already works um, in the particular market, in that case in India, and ensure that it's, it has a, a cleaner uh, way of operation. It has a more impactful way of, uh, of solving the, um, the, the challenge. Yeah, and I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say. All right. Uh, talking about the technology, so what role do clean technologies play in navigating? And uh, do you see any 
concrete initiatives between the UA and India that uh, you know address the climate change and what kind of role do you think the businesses are playing over here? So technology is of course a key, but then they're always embedded in a very complex setting of different uh, layers, policy, regulatory, financial, um, and many more uh, parameters that come into the equation. But of course, um, the change can be driven by means of greener, cleaner technologies. So it's really important for the European Union and India further strengthening their collaboration in this regard to jointly um, co-create um, technologies that can tackle the challenges on the ground, um, jointly um, innovate um, and, and kind of evolve the solutions as they are required. Um, in this regard, when it comes to concrete initiatives, and again, I'm coming back to Manu, sorry for that, but there are indeed already some projects that are quite um, uh, concrete in in this kind of uh, perspective, we have the, the International Urban Corporation that also has an India chapter. And the International Urban Corporation was, uh, has emerged 2016 on the basis of this 2030 agenda. And in India, it has um, already supported 12, I believe, cities with regard to um, framing their local action plans and another seven cities when it comes to their climate action plans and has also um, established uh, so-called twinning city uh, mechanisms. So they're like sister cities from a European country and in India, um, where then on, on that very basis, one can really work together at a municipal level and, and also bring in from the respective places the, um, the expertise and the technologies. So this is a very nice um, kind of initiative that we also support in terms of business involvement. Um, and yeah, I can share more information on that if you if you like. So, um, according to you, uh, how far do you think sustainable development and economic growth is an emer emerging market in India? Sorry, could you come again? I, could, I think acoustically, I, I could not hear the question. Am I audible now? Yeah. Sorry. So um, according to you, are sustainable development and economic growth of an emerging market like India a contradiction? Not at all. I would say it's a strategic imperative um, for emerging markets to, to really think sustainable and um, have a strong commitment to it. And India, of course, clearly um, has put in place such commitments and uh, is even leading some of that globally. Like, the International Solar Alliance is one very good example. So India has really made um, those objectives that also um, uh, the, the underpinning uh, components of the Paris Agreement part of their own growth um, story. And, and that's quite commendable. And that is also why, once again, um, the EU and India are natural partners, because um, the EU clearly has, and now um, ever more so because of the pandemic, made it very clear that the economic growth can only be um, can only be linked to to a path which is green which is sustainable which which is based upon the principles of circular economy of a green economy and um, in India in this regard also has shown again that this is also the vision that they are taking um, very early on in this summit we've heard from the from the MLA uh, who provided his uh, inaugural address that uh, the developing markets are sometimes um, are actually uh, those who um, who suffer the most but might not really contribute a lot to the overall problem and I think that's exactly also why it's very important for an emerging market like India to be proactive and continue on that path and uh, Europe and India are really uh, well equipped to um, to join hands and use the synergies and, and do the, the most uh, or, 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 or the best that they can, because it does not only, um, and again, I'm thinking more from a business point of view, it's not only about uh, those sometimes intangible objectives that we hear in the news that we have to reduce uh, 
uh, certain kinds of uh, emission values and so on. But it also very hands-on means employment. It means uh, that you that you assure a sustainable future um, for your economies, and that's important. Thanks for giving us a perception from the business point of view. Uh, it's not something that we often get to hear, especially regarding environmental issues. Uh, so moving on, Mr. Navid Green Solutions, uh, his core expertise is in design, development, commercialization, and policy in clean technologies. Uh, he has received the prestigious EU India Young Leaders Award at the EU Parliament in Brazil and was also nominated to the World Academy of Sciences Engineering Science Prize in 2018 in Italy. Um, he has also played a key role in many green technologies in the fields of biogas, solar, and other renewable energies. He founded Chakra Green Solutions in India, which uh, dedicates its expertise to promoting green and uh, clean technologies. So over to you. Hello, good evening, uh, good afternoon in UK and in European countries. Uh, hi, Sujit. I see a lot of visual faces. Are you audible? Now, when yes. you're audible, but you'll have to adjust your frame. Am I audible, Priya Darshan? We can only yes. see how. Yes, you are. Yes. Okay. So I can see a lot of visible faces, Aryan and uh, Sujit. Adam, I know. yes, hi. <laughs> Plenty of them I met at the Brussels, and uh, it's great that you know they are here. I congratulate Sujit uh, for having uh, you know organized this fantastic event and bringing all the right stakeholders on climate change and green economy of prime importance. Uh, well, uh, I have been on this uh, topic for nearly more than a decade now. And uh, Navin, there are some good news and bad news. Yes? Navin, if I may in, interrupt you for a minute, we've got a MP, Robbie Moore, waiting at the lobby. Um, we, we might have to interrupt the panel discussion for five minutes before his speech and questions, and then we can carry on. OK. Yeah? OK, all right. Um, Yeah, that is. Robbie, are you there? I, I can see you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for joining. Um, yeah, hi. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we just uh, interrupted the panel discussion for five minutes to accommodate you and your speech and question and answers. So uh, to everyone, just, just to give uh, Robbie's background, um, Robbie is from a, a farming family in rural Lanarkshire, which could be Punjab of India, maybe. Uh, in 2007, set up a plastic recycling business that has now grown to a consistent national network of franchises, collecting and recycling waste um, of farm plastic waste. Uh, he, he, he's an arch architecture architect, um, studied at University of Newcastle. Robbie also trained as a rural chartered surveyor and having worked for a firms of rural survey for over 10 years and set up his own consultancy practices with, with the team of six prior to entering the parliament. Robbie has also worked for a variety of charity charitable causes, which has included a loneliness program, which provided a body service for those with learning difficulties aged from mid-teens to early 20s and provided assistance on an, an employment program, which was specifically designed to empower people with uh, confidence to enter the workplace. Uh, before being selected to contest, Kaylee and Kaylee and Linky consistent, consistent, sorry, Consist Consistent, yeah, sorry. Um, Robbie served as a, a county councillor, Northumbria County Council for Alwink, Alwink Ward. He also stood as 2019 Northumbria Police and Crime Commissioner by election. 
since his election, Robbie has been elected to serve on Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Select Committee, as well as DEFRA Religious Committee. Bill. So, Robbie, thank you very much for joining, and we look forward to hearing hear your speech. There might be questions in the end, but um, we'll come back to that. Perfect. Are, are you happy for me to to go now? Is that the... Yeah, absolutely fine. No problem. Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you very much um, indeed uh, for inviting me along to the Europe India uh, Centre for Business and Industry. Uh, I really do uh, appreciate the kind offer to speak. Um, it's exceptionally kind and it is a real pleasure uh, to share the stage uh, with the chair and the vice chair, uh, as well as other guest speakers. So it is great to join you all. Creating a green economy and tackling climate change issues, um, uh, which can only be solved, uh, can only be solved by countries uh, working together. So it is great to see that um, we have got uh, such great uh, uh, international panel coming together. And I, of course, uh, speak to you as um, a individual member of the uh, United Kingdom Parliament, uh, not as a representative of the UK government. So it is great to speak at such an exciting point in the relationship uh, between the United Kingdom and India. As one of the growing, uh, fastest growing economies in the world, India is a crucial partner to the United Kingdom. Bilateral trade between the UK and India stands at nearly 24 billion pounds and grew by 11% in the last year alone. This is not just a benef uh, benefit to us in terms of the financial returns um, here in the UK and uh, in India, but of course, in terms of uh, targeting development assistance uh, from the United Kingdom government. Trade links for the two countries can also help reduce poverty and foster prosperity in India. The countries are also working together in the fight against coronavirus. The United Kingdom has received over 11 million face masks and 3 million packets of paracetamol from India during the pandemic. As the pharmacy of the world, over 1 billion doses of the UK's, uh, UK's Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine are being manufactured in India. The United Kingdom's partnership with India is both invaluable and indispensable, but can be strengthened in the years ahead. The Foreign Secretary made clear his intention when he visited India at the end of last year. And it is also great to see the Prime Minister announced that India would be his first bilateral visit since taking office. Whilst it was disappointing that he had to cancel his visits to India's, uh, uh, to visit um, uh, on India's Republic Day celebrations in January, the Prime Minister, I am sure, will want to visit India as soon as he is able to do so. The relationship between the UK and India does and should extend beyond trade. Cooperation between the United Kingdom and India is crucial for building a green economy and tackling climate change. The green economy is of great importance to me and a priority for me since I became a member of parliament in 2019. And you heard from the introduction uh, that I am involved in a plastic recycling business. And we also farm as a family. Um, and they are occupations that I was deeply involved in before becoming a member of parliament. I am a member of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Select Committee, which holds the government to account in terms of decisions are made around the environment, food and rural affairs. And since I joined, we have published a report on the future of air quality, and I regularly speak about environmental issues in the House of Commons chamber. Building a green economy is not just a personal priority, um, though, but a real ambition for the current UK government. In November, the government released their plan for a green industrial revolution. The plan will revolutionise green transport by accelerating the shift to zero emission vehicles 
and will make public transport more sustainable. It will enhance developments in offshore wind, low carbon hydrogen and nuclear power. The government have pledged 12 billion worth of investment towards the plan and we expect up to three times as much investment to come from the private sector. And all of this to help create 250,000 green jobs. I believe that the response to the COVID-19 pandemic creates an opportunity, not a hindrance, up to building a green economy. The UK government wants to build back better, but it must do so in a way which makes the economy stronger, greener, more sustainable and more resilient long into the future. The UK government has already committed to investing an extra 200 million in carbon capture technology, as well as to provide up to 500 million to trial the use of hydrogen for heating and cooking in homes as part of its COVID-19 recovery plan. I am aware that there are fears that Brexit may hinder Britain's ability to work with the European Union, as well as other international partners on the issue around climate change. However, I do not foresee this being a problem at all. The European Council on Foreign Relations has found that climate change policy is a promising avenue for cooperation after Brexit. And British exports consulted by the Council have ranked it as the number one priority for UK-EU relations. The withdrawal agreement itself commits the UK and the EU to ensuring a level playing field when it comes to maintaining high levels of protection against climate change. The government knows it can't fight climate change with a one-man army, which is why I know it is so committed to working with international allies on the matter. This, of course, includes India, who are a vital partner with regards to building our green economy. There are more than 400 British companies based in India, and some of those are at the forefront of our partnership to tackle climate change. There are UK firms investing in jobs and opportunities for the development of renewable energy in India, as well as in the manufacturing of electric cars. Take the example uh, of the joint venture between the, e, uh, between the UK and the EO charging and India's Yavi ex, uh, enterprises who are working in partnership to deliver charging infrastructure for electric vehicles in India. The UK government is also working with the India's Ministry of Earth Sciences to build flood defences and river structures in India and cooperating in data gathering to advance monsoon forecasting. Looking to the future, I was delighted to see Prime Minister Modi accept Boris Johnson's invitation for India to be one of the three guest nations at the G7 summit in Cornwall in southwest England later this year. Climate change will be a big issue at the summit, so it is great news that both the United Kingdom and India will be around the table to discuss strengthening global environmental policy. In November, Prime Minister Modi will return to the United Kingdom for the COP26 summit in Glasgow. The UK sees its presidency of COP26 and India's presidency of the G20 summit in 2023 as key platforms for implementing the Paris Agreement. The Right Honourable Alok Sharma MP, the president of COP26, met with Prime Minister Modi only this month to discuss the United Kingdom's and India's shared commitment to climate action. They noted the roles their governments, businesses and individuals in the UK and India will play in tackling climate change. I was so pleased to see them discuss helping the most vulnerable countries in adapting to the impacts of climate change. The role of governments of countries 
such as the United Kingdom and India is crucial to protecting the smaller nations, which is why Alok Sharma and Prime Minister Modi reaffirmed the importance of the UK and India meeting their climate financial commitments. Whilst the last year has reshaped the priorities of governments around the world because of the COVID-19 pandemic, building a green economy and the fight against climate change have remained at the top of the United Kingdom's to-do list. These are issues that are tackled through international cooperation and nations working together. That is why we are lucky to have India as a partner in that fight. The relationship between the UK and India is great, but I know that it can be greater still. Climate change policy is of the utmost importance and provides a great opportunities uh, for the two countries to work together. I really do believe that the future holds a very real possibility for the UK and India in the fight against climate change. By working together, collectively, we can achieve so much more. And to ensure we leave the planet in a much, much better state for many, many generations to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robbie, for such a great speech, talking about partnerships and how you can, India could move forward. And um, we've got two questions from Dr. Manu, who is a, a researcher at Cambridge University. So Manu, do, do you want to ask a question? Thank you. Thank you, Robbie and Pete. That was a very passionate and a very interesting speech. Thank you for that, highlighting those key uh, partnerships and the roles that both the countries have to play. Um, and I'm particularly um, interested and very excited about the Coalition for the Disaster um, Resilient Infrastructure that the UK is co-chairing co within there. Um, my question is to do with regarding divestment from fossil fuels in particular. Um, it was just a few days back that uh, we got to know that the couple of local councils in the UK, though they have declared a climate emergency, are sort of continuing to pour money into fossil fuels. So with that joint agreement, a lot of countries, including India and UK, making that we will be transitioning to a fossil fuel free economy. Um, how do you think that we should be sort of engaging with councils at different levels to make sure that we are telling the right message out to the world? Uh, a fantastic question, and I absolutely believe that the, um, the, the priority for all governments should be to move towards a fossil free um, uh, means of producing uh, energy. Um, and that's why I know that the, the UK government is absolutely uh, committed to uh, looking at opportunities around hydrogen um, and uh, nuclear, but also renewable energy. Um, which we've seen the rollout over years, but the technology is increasing. And uh, the UK government is certainly wanting to increase its offshore wind uh, energy um, generating capacity. I think um, uh, uh, the government and all governments um, have a unique role to play in influencing councils and influencing policy making decision, not only by themselves, but through other policy making bodies around the world. Um, because when we are talking about climate change, um, we're, it, it, it can't be done in isolation. Uh, it really does need to be done by all governments working together, which is why I'm so excited that the Paris Agreement uh, is now, or it feels that it's now uh, back in, um, the ball's now rolling. Um, especially with uh, the United States back on board. Uh, I, I think that that is absolutely critical. Um, and I think that it's through those national levels by influencing um, you know, councils at all levels, right down to a micro level to uh, get policy right. Um, but it's also worth noting that policy does take time to, um, to put in force. Um, and I think government's eyes and ears need to be open to listening to suggestions, um, because what I think we, what can always be the negative 
of, uh, of policy can be that you come up with policy that's impractical to implement. And I really do think that sometimes uh, you need to make sure that whilst you may set targets, they've got to be aspirational, but they've got to be achievable. And you have to have a plan on how you want to get there and how you're going to achieve it um, and, and be sensible about it. Um, and I think that's where the balancing act comes into play. So what I'm actually looking forward just to finish off quickly is COP26 conference later this year provides a fantastic opportunity for all countries to come together and actually have some really open and frank conversations about, um, you know, looking at better means of energy generation going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ravi. Thank you, Manu. Um, Navin, would, would you like to ask a question? Do you have a question? Robbie? Yes. Uh, hello, Mr. Right, thank Mr. Honourable Member of Parliament. Yeah, thank you for your encouraging words regarding the, the vaccination uh, uh, drive. So, do you think India would play a similar could play a similar role in climate action, which already India, uh, you know, is already undertaken a national action plan on climate change? Is an observation I want from you. But I have a question, COP26, in terms of meeting climate. Navin, you, Navin, you're breaking up. Yeah, so is it okay now? Yes. Yeah, so my question is, uh, since COP26, uh, India has taken a leading position in uh, meeting 155 degrees centigrade temperature limit through its various uh, national action plan on renewable energy emissions target as well as energy efficiency savings. So, but at the same time, India being a big uh, country with uh, 1.3 billion people population, uh, there is a big uh, uh, requirement of financing. So one of the important uh, cooperation measures agreed on the COP26 is the climate financing from the developed nation, which is uh, one of the biggest articles. How do you see, uh, you know, UK and EU will play a big role uh, you know, in climate financing, which is not taken, uh, you know, significant uh, development. Is that my question? Yeah, I, 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 again, another very, a very good question. And I'm sure that um, there'll be much discussion around green financing at COP26. Um, you mentioned, you know, uh, the, the fantastic work that gets done through collaboration at an international level. Uh, and we've seen that through, through the vaccine uh, production. And we've seen that through how countries can actually work together to, uh, through pandemics. And, you know, I mentioned in my speech there that over a billion doses of the UK um, Oxford AstraZeneca's vaccine are being produced in India, um, you know, which is fantastic. And I, I actually think that throughout the pandemic, there's a lot of learning that can be done at a government level about how countries can actually better um, cooperate. And when we turn that to looking at uh, the green economy and the green agenda, I think there's some clever uh, models that can be adopted to do with green financing um, and also um, uh, 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 green, um, uh, green, uh, green bonds that can be um, effectively traded as well. And I think that, that, that there's, there's those sorts of mechanisms should all, all be explored because the reality of it is government's role is to create legislative policy that works and can be adopted and that will influence change. But as we all know, uh, a government's other responsibility is to obviously generate tax to then uh, to spend that tax wisely on its priorities. But there are other means of, spend, of, of, of generating funds to implement some really good green schemes through private sector. And I think that that's where some good initiatives could be fought through to do with um, green gilt, green bonds, um, uh, uh, and also uh, 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 carbon trading uh, and, and all of those sorts of um, uh, um, parameters and, uh, and aspirations, I think. So what I'm looking forward to COP26 is, is the, the, the remit of bringing some good thinking together um, to actually get, uh, you know, into, to really influence international policy to, to drive that green agenda, I think. All right. Thank you, Navin, and thank you, Robbie, for your answer. I don't think we have any questions. Do anyone have any any further questions for Robbie? I think he needs to leave. 
No. All right. Okay. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you for your speech. Thank you for your time, and thank you for your contribution. Uh, we look forward to to many more of these in the future, and uh, we look forward to release the report as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A pleasure. Bye. All right, Priya, you can carry on with the panel discussion. Sorry, Navin, I have to interrupt in the middle because Robbie has a <laughs> Robbie has a short span of period that he can um, he can contribute. So, all right, uh, so Priya, that was very much in uh, in with our panel discussion. I think. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, Priya, it's, okay, it's so all Naveen down. Can to you. Um, continue as he had already started. So, Navin, please. Yeah, so I think uh, Honorable Member uh, Parliament uh, has mentioned the critical points which I also asked him. Uh, I wanted to emphasize on the similar points. See, the biggest uh, challenge we are right now facing is not, uh, you know, emissions target. Although, you know, I might sound a uh, little, uh, you know, uh, in a, uh, cynical, but uh, I think we may well accomplish this target, you know, if we really, you know, want to and everything is in place but the biggest challenge we are facing right now is the land degradation and desertification and also food security when i say land degradation it means uh, you know uh, again there is a industrialization which is in picture and uh, like industrial textile industry and life sciences industry and then usage of water energy uh, to some extent emission also and then we're talking about the uh, land use which is like mining and use of soil for agriculture purposes so again which is connected to food security again which is uh, water energy and uh, chemical industry which is linked so there is a comprehensive uh, plan needs to be in place for this uh, requires uh, deploying uh, innovative and also scalable technologies at the same time requires uh, you know global scale funding and financing um, so i touched upon that point and as far as i am concerned i have been working on uh, some of the projects uh, basically i come from the uh, industrial segment i have been on the uh, you know academy of sciences for 8 years uh, recently i have because of short of time i have uh, not been active there and and uh, right now i would like to work with uh, various uh, stakeholders such as uh, researchers and technology technocrats and civil society uh, for the exchange of information and technology transfer and identifying the right solutions that is my priority yes priya Hello. All right. So um, maybe you can give us an idea about the G and finance post uh, the Paris Agreement. See, uh, I I'm have not having uh, uh, exact knowledge about the legal framework about the financing, which is not been uh, uh, agreed on a broad basis. Uh, you obviously you know that one of the uh, uh, countries which is uh, party. Was, has not come on board, which they recently have come on board uh, a few, couple of weeks ago. So we have to see how that will play out. And uh, there was a $500 billion US dollars, uh, you know, promise which was made at the time of negotiations. And uh, the disbursement mechanism was not decided. So probably this year, uh, I think in the UK, COP26, it is very critical how countries like India, which has has actually uh, voluntarily, uh, you know, committed and also went ahead uh, implementing the, its target of limiting 1.5 degrees centigrade and emissions before pre-industrial levels. And I think we are going to meet our target by 2030. Uh, but I, having said that, the biggest challenge, uh, you know, that uh, countries like India facing uh, is that we have to maintain a sustainable development and we have to meet our climate action plan and uh, you know bringing the uh, investments and finance uh, is a big challenge so therefore uh, this i think i congratulate sujit that you know he has clubbed green economy and climate change which is very much apt 
in fact he uh, i think his team was asking me that uh, you know uh, what should be the you know dialogue so i said it can't be separated <laughs> so uh, the climate change is economy actually and it has to be a green economy circular economy blue economy there is no single idea which uh, we can you know uh, uh, meet our objectives the entire uh, economic system on various market principles such as uh, you know uh, fisheries or you know rivers water uh, water conservation uh, you know uh, organic farming say you know minimizing chemical fertilizers textile industry which is one of the biggest uh, you know uh, uh, source of uh, pollution uh, which comes into the food cycle and also oceans uh, i think the other uh, panelist was there kaushal he was working on bio packaging i think that is also one of the great area we can look at solutions so what we need here is huge investment and uh, the entrepreneurs and the industrial uh, solutions and the investment is the only way we can uh, go forward and the economy has to be completely uh, aligned with the uh, you know the various mechanisms the honorable member was mentioning about the carbon trading and green bonds but again uh, these are or uh, intermittent mechanisms of financing uh, we need a primary source of mechanism which is uh, primary from investors and banks so yeah so uh, with the constant um changing dynamics of the market principles uh, what is the role of india and the eu in it uh yes that's a very very good question uh, priya and uh, in fact uh, that question should have put to the member of parliament <laughs> but uh, however uh, i actually not coming from a political background but with my limited knowledge of uh, my time which i spent in uh, eu i traveled about seven to eight countries uh, didn't had the opportunity to go to uk uh, what i have uh, understood is there is a big scope for a technology transfer not in every sphere of life uh, but largely on the industrialized world which is like factories we can say 4.0 uh, production uh, we can say artificial intelligence uh, which is actually uh, high end automation which can save our uh, you know uh, resources and increase our productivity uh, so there you can play a huge role in technology transfer and uh, partnership in uh, industry partnership the second would be uh, in terms of engaging civil society uh, i would not hesitate to uh, say that you know the climate change uh, has been so far largely you know on uh, on a political mode i think it's time now that uh, india eu and you know or india uk collaboration comes on the pragmatic and rational that you know we have to find solutions so far there was a big uh, you know over the last three or four decades we were engaged in the you know uh, controversial uh, dialogue as to you know what would be the source of energy the fossil fuel or nuclear energy or you know or you know what would be the disadvantages of uh, you know renewable energy i think we are actually cross that era we don't uh, have any luxury on such debates so now because we are already actually in climate change and uh, uh, if you you have seen the climate change report ipcc in 2019 by 2050 we may actually see a 1.5 degree centigrade increase in temperature in global average so that will hit hard uh, tropical climate it's like india or africa Uh, you know in other asian countries where the majority of the population is therefore in this context i think uh, multilateral frameworks and collaboration is the only way and uk being a biggest trading partner for india because india is is the biggest trading partner for uk and is also india is the biggest investor source of investor in uk so therefore it's a primate importance europe in general uh, we have uh, i think there's a lot of potential there's a the member of parliament from germany mentioned about free trade agreement unfortunately it has not 
you know gone further i think it was on back burner for too long so now i think it has to be taken on the front stage because india has already demonstrated itself uh, you know meeting global challenges that it can take on on uh, taking on the global emergency situations such as you know we have seen health grounds and pandemics and climate change we have demonstrated in last 7 years and it's time that you know the 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 eu and india extends a cooperation to fight uh, these challenges i think so we need uh, cooperation at various levels one is the knowledge exchange and then on the institutional level and, and uh, the i think there was also one more point mentioned by uh, shashi dharan i think he from oxford that we need lot of uh, data on uh, you know what's the impact on climate ch- change uh, in countries like india we have seen lot of floods and you know himalayan region melting of ice is also one of the big concerns because majority of fresh water comes from there so the the biggest think tanks in eu uk the scientific data knowledge exchange uh, technology uh, transfer and risk mitigation strategies this all would help yes please. all right thank you navi yeah. um moving on to our next uh, panelist we have uh, mr marius okel is he here yes i'm here hello <clears throat> hi can you hear me good evening good evening that's great <laughs> yes uh, we can hear you okay perfect so i'm just going to give a brief introduction and then you can take the floor so uh, he's the head of cluster international association partnership africa and india german association of the automotive industry he leads the indo german association partnership program between the automotive component manufacturers association of india the society of indian automobile manufacturing uh, through this project funded by the german ministry of economic cooperation and development the associations can successfully common interests such as electric mobility and renewable fuels for the automotive industry in both countries he is responsible for organizing and coordinating conferences workshops joint research papers and bilateral de- delegations in the scope of the project his main areas of expertise are the automotive industry in germany and india contacts relevant to oems suppliers and put- political decision on to you Yes, thank you very much. Um so uh, starting my my um speech or my talk I just wanted to thank you very much um to your colleagues Sujik and yourself for for organizing this summit and I, as part of the um, 2019 class I really uh, like how this initiative is growing and how you can attract more and more members in the EU India UK field to to really uh, touch upon topics and to connect to each other. So it's really great to see this evolving the initiative and I think the speakers are also very great and insightful which you are able to to organize so um, speaking about climate change speaking about europe and india uh, what does come in mind i think it was very very interesting what uh, svenja han also mentioned because she she put a big emphasis on the topic of cooperation and that's also what i would um, what i would emphasize here a lot because cooperation it's it's very important it's not an against each other it's more a with each other between Europe and India and that's what we also have to ensure for the future and i think we are we as the VDA as the German Automotive Industry Association we are very much engaged in india because we see that there's the future potential but there's also future potential not only as a market but also for for collaboration and for ensuring climate protection for the whole world and that's why we deep dive within our association partnership with our indian counterparts acma and siam into various topics coming from electric mobility going into hydrogen going also in safety and fuel standards to to make the to to make the environment and the cars cleaner at the end to do something good for the protection of the environment and that's that's what we are focusing on and what i think is is very interesting to to touch is the the kind of cooperation because from our side from from german automotive industry side we 
right now sometimes I have the feeling that the uh, Indian regulation, we have this uh, new self-reliant India topic, um, which sometimes which has the approach to, to get India more self-reliant and so on and to get more local production and more local value chain, value added chain, which is all good and all totally understandable. But from our side, it goes sometimes a little bit, um, let's say, too quick. And sometimes the second step is a little bit um, done before the first step. So that's why where we really want to emphasize the cooperation, um, that it, it must go hand in hand together with European, with the German companies, um, to see where where we can where we can manage the the um, potential and where we can see cooperation. And for this, I want to highlight also one aspect where um, what Svenja Hahn from the European Parliament mentioned. It's about the free trade agreement. We still think that there's a lot of um, potential, but also interest to really to really engage to enhance trade. And this, at the end, really can bring us um, or can lead us also to climate protection again. That um, some technologies will easier flow from Europe to India if they are demanded there, um, if the trade is eased because, um, between two, our two, let's say, continents, nations, how you went to our two regions, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe this as, as, a, as a start, and I think from, from VDA, German automotive industry side, it's, it's very clear that we aim at a speedy and substantial reduction of greenhouse gas emissions on the pathway towards a climate neutral economy in 2050. So that's our all goal. And you know that we have the EU um, Green Deal coming up now. So it's, it's also very much uh, interesting for, for German companies to, to engage in this. I hope that okay. was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so um, just adding on to it. So what, uh, which technologies do you see emerging for reaching the climate targets yeah it, it, it's quite interesting like from from our perspective it's it's clear that climate protection costs money and requires effort in terms of investment and innovation but we are very much sure that this um, that this money is well spent um, so this goes right now in the direction that we um, that we see evolving electric mobility for sure and it's it's quite interesting because also your, the European regulators they 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 bring us to the to the field that it it may only that definitely electric mobility is taking up, and uh, when we see this as part of the European Green Deal, we have with the Green Deal it, it represents the most ambitious climate protection effort um, with far-reaching uh, implications right now in the in the whole world. So this is where an industry will adapt, but we always say that it. it it's still it's it's technology neutral. Like the approach should be technology neutral. So the the government they can they can do restrictions and they can say okay this should be the way how we how we want to have the the pollution side and how we want to have the greenhouse gases and let the industry see how it how it reaches this. And um, coming also into this direction, I mean there was I think three years ago the Indian. Minister um, for for uh, traffic and road safety. I think he said, "Okay, we we just want to be 100% electric in three years," um, which is actually not that quick possible because sometimes you also need some leap time and you need to to put in, in account some other um, aspects as well. And we we are in favor of, for for hydrogens as well for e fuels. So we are in favor of reaching the climate goals, but let the industry see case by case how to how to reach it. Okay, so um, you know how is the automotive industry contributing to the climate protection then? Yeah, it's it's actually a lot. I mean, when you when you see the um, when you see the targets um, we have to fulfill, um, and the, the first things they have to be fulfilled in two thousand twenty two. They had to be fulfilled. Um, sorry, two thousand twenty. And this all worked out for our uh, big OEMs to, to fulfill this. So it's also going to be hopefully the same in the future that it's possible to, to even fulfill this. And we think like when you, when you see the automotive industry as a, as a part in the whole global value chain, also, also looking into India, that it's, there's so many investments like what, what German automotive industry spends in research and development to really make cars cleaner and greener, that it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something what really uh, what really moves people at the end, but what also moves climate protection if the 
if the emissions fall and also some new things coming up like automated driving, maybe driverless uh, uh, driving and um, some city mobility and so on that will all hopefully foster, uh, foster climate protection. Okay, so uh, one of our previous panelists had also mentioned that, you know, um, we can't really have a one fits all solution. So what is your opinion about that? Yes, that, that's totally true. I think it was something also a little bit lined out in the in the question um, or two questions before that it's, it's every every regulation must take into account the local local requirements. So I, I think we cannot say globally, okay, every electric car is totally climate neutral. Once if the energy energy comes out of coal, for example, it's not easily climate neutral. So it must take into account the local local um, uh, local requirements, local um, considerations, and hence it's not easy to say just one solution fits all. So it needs to be adapted. And what we also say that uh, any new climate targets must allow for for new possibilities for their attainment. So in road transport, it is crucial to provide defor defossilization options for the existing vehicle fleet, such as synthetic fuels, as they provide an additional reduction potential to measures aiming not only at fleet renewal. Electrification and the defossilization of combustion engines must go hand in hand. So what, what do we mean by this? It's not just if you if we say, okay, let's go all electric, all countries, it's, it's great. But or it's, it's, it's one approach. But with this, we don't, what we sometimes forget is the, the overall fleet. So if you say, okay, we also target the energy, like the, the fuel by itself, and see that this is CO2 neutral due to renewable fuels as, and, and so on, I think we might have a little bit more um more like a, a broader broader approach so not only focus on the new cars also focus on the already existing fleet right thanks so like we know that uh people are being more aware right now with the kind of choices they are having with, mm. with the automobiles you know you do see a lot of people moving towards electric cars and all you do see a lot of people having a lot of electric you know bikes right now so mm -hmm. cars are something that people are moving towards so, you know, people are becoming more conscious on the roads right now towards the environment. So, you know, that's a great approach. So do we have any questions for the panelists? My uh, question to uh, Marius would be, how soon can we see a flying car come in? Because that can be a big motivator. <laughs> For uh, the lower rate of electric cars, lower rate of carbon components and stuff. Yeah. Marius, you're at the front end of research. That, that's a good question. Um, actually, I think there have been some some trials for flying cars, but mm -hmm. sometimes I'm really asking myself, do we want to have flying cars all over the cities? I don't know how this may look at the end, but um, I know that there's <laughs> some research and development coming into this, but I, I don't see it in the next five years that everyone owns a flying car, to be honest. <laughs> but you may, uh, anyone, uh, I want, also wanted to make some advertisement. Uh, we have our new IAA mobility show, which is like somehow the biggest mobility show in the world coming up in Munich, organized by VDA this September. So if anyone is interested and uh, is in Europe anyway, so please feel free to visit us. There might also be flying cars. <laughs> Thank so you. Arun, you can come and join us. Sure, Marius. Do we have more questions? Yeah. Thanks. Hey, Marius. Oh, sorry, yes, did I interrupt you? No, it's... I think uh, I have a co-panelist, so... I yeah, yeah, I know. You have a fair chance to ask a question I, I can ask later. I wanted to ask... No, no, go ahead, Naveen. Oh, let's, let's do it now. Okay. Okay. Hey, Marius, wie geht es dir? Sehr gut, danke schön. Sprichst du Deutsch? Yeah, I have been uh, in Stuttgart studied in the University of Stuttgart. Ah, well, that's true. 2008, 2008. Yeah. Auch in Munich, uh, sehen. Auto yeah. show in Frankfurt auch. Ah, sehr gut, yeah. This is our show, right. organized by VDA, the big IAA show, perfect. Wunderbar, wunderbar. Okay, so my question is, uh, you know, more of, uh, uh, you know, I'm a passionate auto guy. Uh, yeah. So, 
by when i think uh, germany want to be completely electric uh, you think you do have uh, angela merkel did give a target that all the autos uh, will be turn electric by when is it by 20 No, that um, from my side, happily not not uh, not true. There is no no target such uh, such like this. So it, it was sometimes under discussion, but we we never had the target that there should be um, like 100% electric. It is still sometimes under political consideration, but it's also coming to like this election fight that there's some like uh, the Green Party. They say okay, 2030, we want we don't want to have any internal combustion engines anymore in new cars, but still. I think as now it's also a, a lot of research going into e-fuels, uh, going into hydrogen. So it, I, I would say the story is not not over yet. And um, I mean, also when you look at, I mean, uh, why are the electric cars that successful right now in Germany? Because also we have an environmental bonus paid by the German taxpayer for 9,000 euros per electric car, which is bought. So I don't know if this bonus is not there anymore in 2025. It's it's going to be stopping. Um, let's see how this goes. And still, I mean, electric cars are way more expensive than just internal combustion cars. So also the people somehow need to to afford individual mobility. And that's also a case what we saw right now in the Corona pandemic. I mean, the the interest into still again going with the car and owning a car it's it's much higher because the the public transport it's a little bit decreases due to I don't know safety for for viruses and so on. So that's That's the story, but you are right. It's it's popping every some months. It's popping up that we should forbid all the, um, I don't know, all the combustion engine cars. So let's see. And um, but there is no official decision on that. <laughs> Why don't you come to India? We will manufacture a cheaper car for you, electric vehicle. Yeah, I know you you tried with the Tata Nano, <laughs> but uh, this is now out of stock. <laughs> I am a couple of times no, in India actually, but like before the pandemic came. You might be surprised that India has come with the world's best car uh, in electric Nexon. Have you heard of it? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I know that it. that was just a bad joke. I know that India is it's pushing a lot for electric vehicles, and it's also. I mean, I visited Auto Expo New Delhi last year. It was my last travel before the pandemic hit, and a lot of investments going into electric and a lot of research and quite well outcomes. In fact, I was actually uh, at the when in 2010 the energy concept 2050 was released in 2009-10. So yeah. at that time, I was working on the uh, the car climate neutral things in Stuttgart. So do you think is it okay? Uh, is it now we are on the right path that uh, energy concept will be implemented by 2050 for Germany? I assume so. We have the pathways are aligned to to do it in, until 2050 and. Uh, still, Germany puts a lot of research into into hydrogen uh, as well, and I, I think for this we need global partnerships as well. Hydrogen, um, it's it's quite interesting to to see in the as well to North Af North Africa um, that we also need to find the sources for for clean hydrogen as well. So I think Germany and Europe we need partnerships to really um, yeah to get to get the energy and the sources clean and at the end to get our transportation clean and. I think it's the same applying for India too. Yeah, so I think Sujit is there to bring more partnerships. You should tell him. Yeah, it's <laughs> <Yeah, that's> great. <laughs> yeah, very good. Oh, the way we plan the dog. Off with us in. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. That's perfect. Do we have more questions? I think we are kind of running behind time as well. No, I, yeah, I think there's no more questions. We already ran off, ran out of time. But thank right. you. Yeah, thank you, Marius, for uh, flying cars and battery. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> thank you for inviting. Yeah, yeah, a pleasure. Um, I think Priya, you can conclude, and then it will give uh, the word of thanks. So um, the overall objective is to, you know, support efforts towards uh, sustainable growth and to build mutual understanding on uh, global environmental issues, uh, including climate change, of course. And given the very welcoming policies and measures already and ones in the pipeline, 
I am sure that we will have more and more occasions to enhance our cooperation to jointly combat the global challenge of climate change and its impact in India, European Union, the UK, and the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.